Bosch just nodded. I stayed up on the soapbox. Anyway, back then, the court was moving us forward. Toward the great society and all that. Now it seems to want to move us back. After another moment of silence, Bosch pointed to the plaque. That saying about good things coming to an end, he said. That was on the locked door at Chinese friends the last time I tried to meet there. I stepped up and put my hand on the wall, covering Legal's name, and held it there for a moment. I bowed my head. They got that right, I said. We didn't talk about the threat from Carlos Lopez until we were back in the navigator. So what do you think he meant about making it right if you don't make it right? Bosch asked. No earthly idea, I said. Guy's a gangster caught up in the Mako gangster ethos. Even he probably doesn't know what he meant by that. You don't take it as a threat? Not a serious one. It's not the first time somebody thought they could make me work the law better by trying to scare me. Won't be the last. Let's get out of here, Harry. Take me back to my place. You got it. Bosch could feel the isotope moving in him, coursing coldly through his veins, over the shoulder and across his chest, like a broken Dan flood. He tried to concentrate on the open file in front of him. Edward Coldwell, 57, convicted of killing a business partner four years before, fresh out of appeals and asking the Lincoln lawyer to work a miracle in his name. Bosch was only halfway through the file he put together with case, documents from the court archives. Coldwell had gone to trial and the jury had believed the evidence against him over his denials. Now it was up to Bosch to determine if the case was worthy of the Lincoln lawyer's time and efforts. Bosch had decided to do the deep dive into Coldwell's case solely on the basis of the letter the convicted murderer had sent to Haller. The majority of requests for Haller's legal expertise came with repeated claims of innocence and allegations of prosecutorial abuse and evidence missed or improperly dismissed. Coldwell's letter had its fair share of that, but it also contained what seemed to be a sincere plea to reveal the real killer and stop him from killing someone else. Bosch had not seen it in the other requests he'd reviewed, and it struck a chord. In his 40-plus year career of working, murder cases, he had been motivated in part by the same sentiment, that if he could catch the killer, he would save another victim and another family from destruction down the line. The case had been handled by the Los Angeles Police Department. The lead detective had been a solid investigator named Gusto Garcia, whom Bosch knew and respected. He was one of the old bulls in the homicide special unit who had been there before Bosch joined the unit and was still there when he left. When Bosch saw Garcia's name on the author line of the first case summary, he almost stopped his review there. He didn't think Garcia would have blown the case, that is, sent an innocent man to prison for a murder he didn't commit. But the file was all he had brought with him to read, and he probably had a half hour or more before he'd be released by the research team. So he kept reading. Garcia had kept a neat and lengthy chronological record of the investigation, and that made it an enjoyable read for someone of Bosch's experience. But page after page he saw nothing amiss, no lead, unfollowed, no step not taken, no interview skipped. In Coldwell's initial letter to Mickey Haller, he claimed he'd been set up to take the fall for the murder of Spiro Apodaca, the man whose Silver Lake restaurant Coldwell had invested in. According to the reports and evidence Bosch had already gotten through, the two had a falling out over what Apodec had done with that investment, and it had led to murder. Coldwell had been convicted, largely on the strength of testimony from the hit man he had allegedly contracted to kill Apodec. The killer for hire, John Mullen, had been identified and arrested thanks to Garcia's good work, and he'd elected to make a deal with prosecutors to testify against the man who'd hired him for the hit in exchange for leniency on his sentence. As far as Bosch could see, the only possible way that Coldwell could be innocent was if Mullen had lied about who hired him to kill Apodaca. The file Bosch had had copied in the archives contained a transcript of Mullen's trial testimony. Bosch had yet to do a deep dive on it, but he'd skimmed it and seen that Mullen was battered during questioning by Coldwell's defense attorney, but did not change his story. Coldwell had reached out to him through an intermediary and hired him to kill Apodeca for $25,000 in cash up front and an equal amount upon completion of the job. In testimony, Mullen said Coldwell stiffed him on the second payment, which explained his readiness to testify against him. Bosch was engrossed in a lengthy entry in the chrono about Garcia and his partner running down how Coldwell accumulated the cash he'd allegedly paid to Mullen. It involved cashing checks and making ATM withdrawals in small amounts over several weeks until it finally added up to $25,000. The amounts were listed in a column in the chrono entry. 
Bosch was going over the math, so he didn't look up when the door to his room was opened. He assumed it was the NNT coming to check his IV bag. Hi, Dad. Bosch looked up and saw his daughter. She was in tight-fitting workout clothes and mics. Mads, how'd you get in here? He said. I don't think it's safe. They told me it was fine, Maddie said. Said I could just walk back. You sure? The NNT said that. The nurse up front. What is an NNT? Nuclear medicine technician. She's the one who sticks the needle in, hangs the bag, starts the process. But I think she wears a lead vest when she comes in here, Bosch said. Probably because she's exposed all the time, Maddie said, or she wants to have babies. She's at least six years old. Oh, well, I'm not going to stay that long. I just wanted to come at least one time to see what they're doing to you. And to drive you home. I can take an Uber. That's what I usually do. I still don't think you should be in here. And we shouldn't share a car. You might want to have babies someday. Dad, let me do this, okay? Okay, okay. Thank you for coming. We'll ask the doctor if it's all right. Fine. Whatever. She pointed to the IV bag. So that's the stuff, she said. What exactly is in it? That's just saline, Bosch said. It goes from there to the radioactive isotope, which then goes into me. Supposedly, they put enough in to kill the cancer, but not enough to kill a patient. Me. That's the trick. Maddie seemed hesitant in her response, but then she blurted out the key question. Do they know if it's working? She asked. Not yet, Bosch said. This is my last dose, and then in a couple months, they'll run some tests and see what's going on. I'm sorry, Dad, to make you go through this. I know you didn't really want to. No, it was my call, and look, if I can stick around a little longer, I get to watch you become the cop you will be, and I may even get some good work. Done too. He gestured to the side table and the file he had been reading. Is that one of the Innocence Project cases? She asked. Yes, Bosch said, but you can't call it that or the real Innocence Project may take offense. Got it. So what do you call it, then? Good question. I don't know if Mickey has a name for it yet. What's the case you have there? Guy convicted of hiring a hitman to take out his business partner. Only he says he didn't hire him. Somebody else did. Problem is, the hitman testified against him at trial. So why are you looking at it? I don't know, really. Something about his letter to Mickey struck me as worth a look. But maybe I was fooled. I've had the whole file out of court, archives, and I'll read it through and then decide if it's worth pursuing further. I mean, what else am I going to do sitting here? Play video games on my phone? That'll be the day. What about the other case? The one with the woman in China? Mickey's going to file for a Habeas hearing, and we're getting hard ducks in a row for that. There are still a lot of holes to fill. Mickey's investigator, Cisco, just located a key witness I'll need to go talk to. Maddie pointed to the IV bag again. But this will knock you down for a few days, won't it? Maybe a day. I'm not sure. They've been increasing the dose each time, so yeah, they'll put me on my back for a bit. At least the rest of the day. You have to quit working for Mickey and concentrate on your health. Be all in on this. Look, I'll be fine in. I'm serious, Dad. Your health has to come first. But I think doing this work and being engaged is part of the whole picture, you know. I feel good when I'm doing this stuff. Otherwise, I feel useless and I get depressed. I'm just saying you need to take it easy. If this treatment works, then you can go back to these cases. I mean, these people aren't going any. She cut herself off when the door opened and a man wearing a light blue lab coat entered. He had a trim build, eyeglasses, and thinning hair, but he looked to be no older than 30. He didn't appear to be wearing a lead vest under his lab coat. Oh, didn't know you had a visitor, Harry, he said. My daughter, Maddie, Bosch said. She's going to drive me home if you say she's safe doing that. The man held his hand up to Maddie. Austin Ferris, he said, your dad's doctor. Oh, Maddie said. Is something wrong? Ferris said. I can come back. No, nothing's wrong, Maddie said. I just, well, I guess I was expecting someone a bit older. I get that all the time, Ferris said, but don't worry, your dad is in good hands. He's got me and a lot of people watching over him. And you're safe to drive him. Harry may be ornery, but he's not particularly radioactive. Ferris turned to Bosch. How do you feel today, Harry? Bored, Bosch said. Ferris stepped over to the IB pole and inspected the bag. 
He reached up and flicked it with a finger. Just not done here, he said. I'll get Gloria into disconnect, and then you'll be on your way in a bit. There was a clipboard in a pocket attached to the pole. Ferris pulled it out and checked the notations made by the NMT. He spoke while reading. So side effects, he asked. Oh, the usual, Bosch said. Mild nausea. Feels like I'm going to throw up, but I never do. Haven't tried to stand since I got here, but I'm sure that will be an adventure. Vertigo? Yes, a fairly common side effect. It shouldn't last long, but we'll want you to stay until we're sure you're okay to go. How's the tinnitus? Still there when I think about it or when it gets mentioned. Sorry, Harry, but I have to ask. If it's all right with you, I want to go as soon as I get detached. I'm not driving, and Maddie will get me home. Ferris looked to Maddie for confirmation. I'll get him home, she said. All right, then, Ferris said. Ferris wrote something on the clipboard and returned it to its pocket. He turned to go. Nice to meet you, Maddie, he said. Take care of him. I will, Maddie said. But before you go, I'm sure you have learned over the past weeks that my dad is not A-plus on communication skills. Can you tell me in layman's terms what you're doing to him and what this clinical trial is all about? He hasn't really told me anything. I didn't want you to worry, Bosch interjected. Happy to, Ferris said. As you probably know, your father's cancer is in his bone marrow. What we're doing here in the trial is taking a medium that has proved to be beneficial in the treatment of other cancers and trying it on his specific cancer. Medium? Maddie asked. What does that mean? It's the isotope, Ferris said. Technically, it's called lutetium 77 It's been used successfully in recent years to treat prostate and other cancers, so our study and clinical trial seeks to determine if Lu-177 therapy can achieve the same positive results with Harry's cancer. We'll know the results soon. And how do you measure results? Maddie asked. Well, in four to six weeks, we'll bring Harry back to do a biopsy. Ferris said. You will definitely need a ride home from that, and the results will tell us where we stand. What kind of biopsy? Maddie asked. We'll go into the bone and draw marrow to get the truest measure. Ferris said. But it's invasive and I have to say there will be discomfort. We need to go into one of the bigger bones for this, so we'll go into the hip. Can we stop talking about this? Bosch said. It's not what I want to think about right now. Sorry, Harry, Ferris said again. One last question, Maddie said. After you do the biopsy, how long until you know the result? Uh, not too long, Ferris said. Depending on what we see, we might do a second biopsy three months later. Maddie turned and looked pointedly at Bosch. You need to include me, she said. I wanted to know. Bosch held up his hands and surrender. I promise, he said. I've heard that before, she said. On the ride home, Bosch's daughter again pressed the point about communications. Dad, really, you have to let me know what you know, she said. You're not in this alone. I don't want you to feel that you are. I did it, I did, Bosch said. Oh, he felt his phone vibrating in his pocket. He pulled it out and saw it was a call from Jennifer Aronson. He guessed it was going to be another plea for his involvement in her nephew's case. He didn't want to take the call but knew that he should. He also knew he had just stopped talking to his daughter in the middle of a sentence. When I know something, you'll know something, he said. Do you mind if I take this call? It'll be quick. Might as well, Maddie said. You clearly don't want to talk about your health with me. Rather than argue, Bosch put his finger on the phone screen and accepted the call. Jennifer, he said. I'm kind of in the middle of something. Can I? That's all right, she cut in. I just wanted to say a big thank you. The D.A. Nall Prost Anthony's case. I'm waiting for it now and so more. It met the district attorney's office and declined to prosecute the case. Wow, that's good, Bosch said. And all because of you, Harry, Aronson said. I brought up the whole scenario that you spun, and don't worry, I never used your name. I asked if the officer was checked for gunshot residue, and they understood how I was going to play it if it went to trial especially if they bumped Anthony to adult status and the case was in open court. They folded like a paper napkin, Harry and Anthony has you to thank. Oh well, I'm glad it worked out, but he should thank you. You made his case to the prosecutor. Following your interpretation of the evidence. Well, the botch didn't know what to say and wasn't sure he wanted his daughter, the cop overhearing this discussion. I know you're busy, Aronson said. I'll let you go. 
I just wanted you to know it happened and to say thanks from both Anthony and me. Okay, well, glad it worked out, Bosch said. See you soon, Mary. Yes. He clicked off and put the phone back in his pocket. Sorry about that, he said. Who was that? Maddie said. Sounded like a woman. Mickey's associate, Jennifer. It was about one of her cases. Sounded like it was one of your cases. I looked at a couple reports. No big deal. Bosch was worried that Maddie would keep asking questions about the case and eventually realize he had worked on the defense of someone accused of shooting an LPD officer. But luckily, Maddie changed the subject. Do you know why Mickey isn't bringing Haley into the firm once she passes the bar? She asked, referring to her cousin, Haller's daughter. Supposedly she doesn't want to do criminal work, Bosch said. I think he said she wants to specialize in environmental law. You're closer to her than me. Did you two talk about it? We haven't talked in a while. I always thought that with me following in your footsteps, she might end up following in his. Bosch thought for a moment before responding. Maddie turned off Kahuenga onto Woodrow Wilson and started the steep ascent to his house. You're not following in my footsteps, Mads. You'll be your own cop. You'll make your own path. I know that, but it's about the badge. We both put on the badge, you know. I'm proud of that, Dad. I'm glad. Me too. And by the way, Mickey saw the picture I have of you with the shiner. He had my phone and pulled it up by mistake. Thought you should know in case you hear from him about it. Well, I hope you told him he should have seen the other guy. I should have. Probably one of his clients. They both laughed but his sarcasm about Haller was apparently not lost on Maddie. Dad, I know Mickey got you into the program at UCLA, but it doesn't mean you have to spend the rest of your life working cases for him. I know. I won't. But there's something. What? I don't know. But like this case we're looking at, if this woman has spent five years in prison for something she didn't do, then getting her out. It's like that saying about it being better for a hundred guilty people to go free than for one innocent person to suffer in prison. I guess I'm saying that this could make it all worth it. If she's innocent. Yeah, the big if. Maddie pulled to a stop at the curb in front of Bosch's house. You want to come in? Bosch asked. I got a Miles Davis triple album from the Third Man Vault, lit at the Fillmore East in 1970. The late great Wayne Shorter's on the sax. I'm going to give it a listen. At Christmas, she had gifted Bosch with a subscription to the distributor of Rare Vinyl out of Nashville. No, but thanks, Maddie said. I think I'm going over to the reservoir for a run. Will you be okay? Of course, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for the ride and for being there today. It means a lot. Anytime, Dad. Love you. Love you. Bosch got out and decided to enter his house through the carport. As he unlocked the side door to the kitchen, he thought about how empty his life would feel without the connection to his daughter. It was more than the shared experience of police work. It was sacred. She was his legacy. He knew that she was what made everything he did seem worth it. It was Monday before Bosch felt steady enough on his feet and mentally focused enough to return to the Lucinda Sands case. Early on he had put together a lengthy to-do list, but there had been no bigger priority than finding and interviewing the victim's girlfriend, Matilda Maddie Landis. Bosch had exhausted all the means of locating her that were available to a man without a badge and the access that came with it. Having learned his lesson in asking Renan Ballard to do something that could get her disciplined or even fired, he refrained from calling on her or his daughter for help. When he reported his failure, Haller said he would put his other investigator on the quest for Matilda. And Dennis Sisko, Wojciechowski, came through, locating the woman who had previously been known as Matilda Landis in less than a day. He didn't pay off a cop to make a computer run and he didn't have to use his size and muscles to intimidate anyone. Because she had not been found through voter registration, property records, or utility records, Sisko had a hunch that she had changed her name, possibly through marriage but also possibly out of fear resulting from the Sands case. When he found no records, substantiating this in Los Angeles County, he hopped on his Harley and headed to San Bernardino County, where public birth records showed that Landis had been born in the town of Hesperia. Legally changing a name in California required petitioning a court and publishing the petition in a local newspaper. If Landis was operating out of fear, it was unlikely that she would advertise her plan to change her identity in the O area. Cisco thought she would go to her hometown, where she might even know a lawyer who could help with her legal task. The Hesperian was a weekly newspaper that didn't offer access to online archives. 
so we went to the Hesperian offices, and after less than an hour coming through hard copies of old editions, he found the public notice of Matilda Landis's intent to change her legal name to Madison Landon. He then went to the courthouse in Victorville and confirmed that a court order had been issued three weeks later. It appeared that Maddie had become Maddie. The name change had been made seven months after Roberto Sands was murdered. Once Cisco had the name Madison Landon, he returned it all aid and ran it through the usual means of tracing an individual. He was able to learn that Landon was a Democrat, had a mortgage on a home in South Pasadena, and had a matching address on her driver's license. Cisco passed this information to Bosch, and now it was time to talk to her. He called Cisco, who'd kept a loose surveillance on Landon while Bosch was on the mend. I'm heading out, he said. Where is she? She's in a bookstore, Cisco said. Brummins, you know it. Yes, on Colorado Boulevard. She's parked in the back lot. She's only been in there a few minutes. I'm probably a half hour out. Call me back if she leaves. Will do, but I'm happy to take the interview if you're not feeling up to it. I'm fine. Mickey wants me to do it. In case I have to testify at the hearing. Got it. Well, I'm here. On the bike? No, I don't do surveillance on the bike. Too conspicuous. I'm in Lorna's Tesla. Where do I meet you? You're in that old Cherokee, right? Yeah, old but new to me. Just pull in and park at Drummond's. I'll see you. On my way. A half hour later Bosch was in the bookstore's back lot. He parked, and by the time he killed the engine and got out, Cisco was waiting for him behind the Cherokee. You know what she looks like? Cisco asked. Just from the driver's license you came up with, Bosch said, she looks different now. Dyed her hair, wears glasses. Huh. Cisco held up his phone and showed Bosch a photo of a woman with lawn hair and black framed glasses, walking across the parking lot they were standing in. He had obviously gotten the shot earlier. That's her? Bosch asked. No, I just took this for laughs, Cisco said. Right, sorry. Look, if you want to come in with me, we can do this together. I know Mickey said he. No, you do it. I might scare her off. Bosch nodded. It was a reasonable concern. He knew that Haller used Cisco when he wanted an element of intimidation or needed protection. Himself. Finessing a reluctant witness into talking, one who might have gone so far as to change her name and looks as a protective measure, was not in his wheelhouse. Okay, then, Bosch said. Here goes. Text me that photo, would you? Will do, Cisco said. Good luck. Bosch headed to the bookstore, going down a set of steps to a sidewalk where the handprints of various authors had been immortalized in concrete. He entered and nodded to a woman at the checkout counter to his left. The place was huge and on two levels. It also had an exit on the Colorado Boulevard side of the building. Bosch quickly realized he might have an issue finding Landon. It was possible that she was not even in the store and had simply used its parking lot passed through like a customer and gone on to any of the nearby shops and restaurants that lined Colorado. It had been almost an hour since Cisco watched her enter. That seemed to Bosch like a long time to spend browsing in a bookstore. He decided to start on the second floor and quickly search the store, before raising an alarm with Cisco. He went up a wide set of stairs in the center and realized that he would not be able to scan the second level from one position. The bookshelves were too high. He moved along the main aisle, looking right and left down each row of shelving. It took him five minutes to cover the entire second level and another five to do the search again. There was no sign of Madison Landon. He went down the steps to search the first level but spotted the woman from Cisco's photograph in line at the register, holding a stack of books. Bosch indiscriminately grabbed a book off a bestseller's table and got into the checkout line behind Madison Landon. When he got there, he read the spines of the books she was holding in both hands. They were all books about raising a child. Landon did not appear to be pregnant, but judging from the titles, it looked like she was getting ready for motherhood. One of the books was Raising Your Child Alone. I raised a child alone, Bosch said. Landon turned to look at him. She smiled, but not in a way that invited further comment on her reading choices. When she was a teenager, Bosch said, it's a tough job. She looked at him again. And how did she turn out? She asked. Pretty great, Bosch said. She went into law enforcement. Then you must worry about her. All the time. Landon's eyes dropped to the book Bosch was holding. I love that book, she said. Bosch looked down to see what he had grabbed. It was tomorrow, 
and tomorrow, and tomorrow. He had never heard of it. He had not been in a bookstore since before the pandemic. I heard it was good, he said. I'll give it a try and give it to my daughter. She'll like it, Landon said. I'm not so sure about you. Why is that? It's about three people, but it's also about developing video games and the creativity it involves. Hmm. Well, sounds like something at least Maddie will like. He noticed that Landon smiled at the mention of the name, but did not reveal that it was also her own name. Why don't you go ahead of me, she said. I have a lot here, and you just have the one. You sure? Bosch said, I don't mind. No, go ahead, because I'm also going to ask them to order a book for me. Thank you. That's very nice of you. She stepped back and he moved up in the queue just as the customer. A head finished her purchase and left. Bosch put the book down on the counter and the cashier scanned it. He paid with cash. He turned back to Landon, held up the book, and said, Thanks. I hope she likes it, Landon said. Bosch excited and then took a position leaning against a wall by the stairs up to the parking lot. He opened the book he had just bought and started reading. A few minutes later, Landon came out of the store with a bag containing all of her purchases. Bosch looked up from his book and Landon quickly turned away, probably thinking he was going to make an awkward attempt at some sort of pickup. You're Maddie, right? He said. Landon stopped in her tracks at the foot of the stairs. What? She said. Or is it Madison? Bosch asked. He pushed off the wall and closed the book. Who are you? Landon said. What do you want? I'm a guy trying to get an innocent woman out of prison, Bosch said, so she can raise her child. I don't know what you're talking about. Please leave me alone. She turned back to the stairway. You know what and who I'm talking about, Bosch said, and why I can't leave you alone. She stopped. Bosch watched her eyes dart around, looking for an escape route. Roberto Sands, he said, you changed your name, moved away. I want to know why. I don't want to talk to you, Landon said coldly. I understand that. But if you don't talk to me, there will be a subpoena, and a judge will make you talk to me. Then it could go public. If you talk to me now, I can try to keep you out of it down the line. Your name, where you live, none of it should have to come out. She brought her free hand up and held it across her eyes. You're putting me in danger, she said. Don't you see that? Danger from who? Bosch asked. Them. Bosch was flying in the dark without instrumentation. He was simply following his instincts in what he had said so far. But Landon's reactions. Here told him that he was clearly on the right path. The Kukos, he asked. Is that who you mean? We can protect you from them. The mere mention of the sheriff's clique seemed to send a shudder through her body. Bosch had been careful to keep his distance but now he casually stepped closer. I can see to it that you have no part in what's about to go down, he said. No one will ever know your new name or where you are. But you have to help me. You found me, Landon said. They can find me. They, whoever they are, won't even know. This is just you and me. But you need to talk to me about the day Roberto got shot, what was going on, what he was into. Have you talked to Agent Massasic? Not yet, but I will. When I know more from you. Bosch didn't recognize the name, but he didn't want to let Landon know that. It might undercut her confidence in the promise he had just made. But her calling Miss Isaac an agent raised an immediate flag. It indicated that Miss Isaac was a Fed, which meant that any number of agencies in the federal sandbox could have been involved with Roberto Sands. Even if Landon refused to cooperate, he now had a new lead to pursue. I have to think about this, Landon said. Why? Bosch said. For how long? Just give me today, she said. Give me a number and I'll call you in the morning. Bosch knew better than to let a potential witness go off to think about things. Fears could multiply. Legal advisors could be pulled into the decision. You never let a fish off the hook. Can we just talk now, off the record? Bosch said. I won't record it. I won't even take notes. I need to know about that day. A woman who may be innocent, a mother, is in prison. For her, every single day, Every hour is a nightmare. You knew Eric, her son. She needs to be with him to raise and ride. But I followed the case and she pleaded guilty. Landon said, now she says she's innocent. She pleaded no contest to a reduced charge of manslaughter because she had to risk life imprisonment in a trial. Landon nodded as though she understood Lucinda Sands's plight. Okay, she said. Let's get this over with. Where? We can sit in my car, Bosch said. 
or your doors, or find a coffee shop to sit in. My car? I don't want to do this in public. Then your car it is. Haller didn't return the call until Bosch was driving up Woodrow Wilson to his house, where he planned to rest. The flow of adrenaline that had kicked in once Madison Landon started talking about the day Roberto Sands was murdered had tapered off and left him exhausted. Before leaving the parking lot at Brummins, he had texted Cisco to thank him once again for finding Landon, and then he'd put in the call for Haller. Forty minutes later, Bosch was almost home and ready to go horizontal for an hour or so, Haller called back. Sorry, was in court. What's up? Sands was late bringing his son home to Lucinda, because he was with the FBI. There was a long moment of silence. You there, Mick? Yes, just digesting this. Who told you this, the girlfriend? Yes, off the record. She wants no part of this. She's scared. Of who? The Kukos. Who were the agents? Did you get any names? One partial. Agent Massasek. It won't be hard to get a full name and assignment. I'm going to start making calls once I get home. This changes everything, you know. How so? Massasek won't talk to you. I can pretty much guarantee that. And the feds routinely swat state court subpoenas away like Mookie Bet swats, fastballs over the plate. Did the girlfriend, what's her new name again? Madison Landon. Did Madison Landon know what the meeting with Agent Messiasek was about? No, she just knew it was serious. Sands told her he was jammed up on something, his words, and had to talk to the FBI. The only reason she knew the name Messiasek was that she heard Sands say it on a call when they were setting up the meeting that day. Habler went silent again. Bosch knew he was thinking of the possible legal scenarios this new information presented. He pulled the Cherokee into the carport of his house. He killed the engine but stayed seated phone to his ear. So what are you thinking? He finally prompted. The FBI changes things, Howler said. I'm thinking I may need to find a way to get this into federal court without first showing our hand in state. Court. I don't know what that means. Well, like I said, we'll never get Messesic into superior court. But we have a good shot at getting him into federal court. The thing is, you're supposed to exhaust all state appeals before you file in a U.S. district court. But if we go that route, they'll see us coming a mile away. They'll be locked and loaded, prepared for us. We don't want Messesic knowing what's coming when I say, Agent Messesic, tell us about this conversation you had with Roberto Sands a couple hours before his murder. Now, Bosch was silent as he considered the path they were on with Lucinda Sands. I think we need to hold up on reaching out to Miss Amisig, Hattler said. But we need to know why he was with Sands the day he was killed, Bosch countered. We do. But let's circle around him a little bit and see what else we can find before we knock on the FBI's door. Not sure where else to circle? That's because you're thinking like a cop and not a defense investigator. What's the difference? The difference is that it's a stacked deck. When you're a cop or a prosecutor, you have the almighty power of the state behind you every step of the way. All the state's resources and reach. On the defense side, it's just you. It's David and Goliath, and you're David baby. It's why getting a win is so special and so very rare. I think that's a little simplistic, especially with all the red tape and rules slanted in favor of the defendant, but I get the point. So if I'm laying low on the FBI, what do you want me doing instead? I'm sure you'll think of something. Just give me a few days to figure how we deal with the feds. I need to talk to some people to see if we can make this jump to federal court. Still parked in the carport, Bosch stared straight ahead, thinking of possible next moves. He assumed that the FBI had something on Sands and that was the reason for the clandestine meeting on a Sunday afternoon. Sands was jammed up and Miss Isaac was applying pressure for him to turn. Informant. Based on recent and very public history, the Bureau had been heavily focused at the time on corruption in the Sheriff's Department, with a particular interest in the flourishing of deputy cliques there. Bosch didn't need to talk to Miss Isaac to know this. The question was what did the FBI have on Sands that was more serious and actionable than him being in a clique, and had it led to his murder? Bosch knew that Howard didn't need to have all the facts to carry out his duties. Most defense attorneys operated by the where there's smoke, there's fire creed. They needed to sow the seeds of doubt, but didn't necessarily have to believe in the doubt sound. But Bosch could not operate that way, even if he was working for a defense lawyer. He needed to get through the smoke to the fire. If there was a fire, 
As his mind pushed through the smoke, he came to realize what his next move would be. If he could not go directly to Mesa Isaac, he knew who he could take a run at. As he pulled back his thousand-yard stare, he realized he had been looking through the windshield at the door to the kitchen and hadn't even noticed something. It was three inches ajar. Are you there, Bosch? Haller said. Or did I lose you in the hills? I'm here, Bosch said, but hold on a second. Bosch removed the key from the ignition and used it to unlock the glove compartment. He grabbed his gun and got out of the car, weapon in one hand, foam in the other. In a low voice, he spoke to Haller. I just got home and my door's open. Pretty sure I didn't leave it that way. Then hang up and call the cops. I'm going to check it out first. Harry, you're not a cop. Let the cops check it out. Just hold on. Bosch dropped the phone into his pocket without disconnecting. He approached the door with the gun in a two-handed grip and used the muzzle to push it all the way open. Standing still, he listened for a moment before entering, but heard nothing. From his vantage, he saw nothing amiss in the galley kitchen. He tried to recall how he had left that morning after getting the call from Cisco. He had been in a hurry, but he could conceive of no circumstance where he would have left the door open. He had lived in the house more than thirty years. Pulling the door closed until the lock clicked was automatic, pure muscle memory. He took a step back into the carport to check whether he had missed, seeing his daughter's car parked on the street when he had pulled up to the house. Maddie's car was not there and there were no other vehicles that drew, Bosch suspicion. He turned back to the kitchen door and quietly entered, the house again, holding the gun up at the ready, his most valuable tool. Now it was his hearing but his left ear was afflicted with low-level tinnitus. He strained to hear any sound. He made the turn out of the kitchen and into the entry area by the front door. This gave him a view of the living room and dining area. He moved forward but noticed nothing unusual until he got into the living room and saw a record spinning on the turntable. The toner was up. No music was playing. Bosch switched the player off and stared at the record until it stopped turning. It was the Miles Davis. Lied at the Fillmore East album he had last played days before. He knew he had left it on the platter, but he was sure he had turned off the player. Harry, what's happening? Bosch heard Haller's tinny voice coming from his pocket. He pulled out his phone and responded. So far, nothing seems wrong. But somebody was here, and they wanted me to know it. You sure? Bosch realized that someone had been smoking in the house. He hadn't smoked in twenty years, but he knew the smell that hung in the air in a closed space when someone recently had. I'm sure, he said. Who? Haller asked. I don't know. Yet, you need to call the cops. Hit it on the record. I'm not finished checking the house. Let me call you back. Fine, but you need to call the... Bosch disconnected, dropped the phone in his pocket, and continued the sweep of the house. He checked the bedrooms and bathrooms, but saw no further evidence of intrusion. He sat down on his bed. He thought about things and wondered again if it was possible that he had left the door open and the turntable spinning. Maybe the smell of a cigarette was a ghost memory of his own former addiction or a side effect of his medical treatment. He knew that short-term memory loss and a heightened or diminished sense of smell or taste were possible side effects of the therapy he was receiving. Dr. Ferris had given Bosch his personal cell number, and Bosch thought about calling now. But he quickly dismissed the idea. What was Ferris going to say beyond what was already in the small print of the materials? Bosch had signed. Forgetfulness was a possible side effect. Bosch felt tired and old, and defeated. He put the gun on the side table. The pillow looked so inviting. He thought about calling his daughter to see if she had come by and left the door open. She didn't smoke, as far as Bosch knew, but the man she was dating did. He decided he would do it later. He would also decide whether to call the police later. Right now he needed to rest. He lay down and soon his dark thoughts about mortality slipped away and he was dreaming of himself as a younger man, moving through a tunnel with a dying flashlight. ITWS a five-hour drive and Bosch left home in pred on darkness to get ahead of traffic and make it to the prison by 10 a.m., the start of visiting hours. He knew he was risking a 10-hour round trip and the waste of a whole day if Angela Costa refused to see him. But he was riding on a hunch based on decades of experience in law enforcement and banking that a 29-year-old lifer would welcome any interruption or change of pace in a schedule that offered little of it for the next 40 or 50 years. The trick would be getting him to open up and talk once they were face to face. 
Along the way, he burned through his whole playlist of favorite jazz recordings from Cannonball Adderley to Joe Zonnell, finishing with Weather Reports Birdland, Zonnell's signature fusion composition, as he pulled into the visitor's parking lot at Corcoran State Prison. The music had cleared his mind of the concerns he'd been carrying since arriving home to see his kitchen door open three days earlier. He had found himself in the strange position of hoping it had been an intruder and not the other option. The first indication of a slide into dementia. He had filed a police report but knew that it was the kind of crime that would receive little attention from the LAPD's North Hollywood Division burglary unit. The officer who took the report was not convinced there had been a break-in, since Bosch could not say whether anything was taken. The officer did not bother to call a fingerprint technician to the house either. Bosch could not fault him for this, given his own uncertainty. Bosch had been to the state prison at Corcoran many times as a badge-carrying detective, but this was his first time as a civilian. Finding Angel Acosta had not been as difficult as locating Madison Landon. Bosch had gone back to the digital archives of the OA Times and come through all the follow-up stories on the shootout between Roberto Sands and gang members at a Lancaster hamburger stand. One gangster was killed, one was wounded and arrested, and two got away. The one that was arrested was identified in subsequent stories as Angel Acosta. He had been shot once in the abdomen but recovered in the hospital ward at the county jail and a year after the shootout pleaded guilty to assaulting a law enforcement officer. To Bosch, it looked like a sweetheart deal. Three to five years for shooting at a sheriff's deputy. On top of that, Acosta wasn't tagged with responsibility for his fellow gangbanger's death. That was usually an add-on in gang cases when someone was killed in the commission of a crime. California prosecutors no longer followed this practice because of adverse appellate rulings, but six years ago it was still a routine enhancement slapped on the defendant. Why Acosta hadn't faced it from his initial arrest was unclear. The light sentence didn't matter in the long run because Acosta was later convicted of murdering a fellow inmate. His new conviction carried a life, sentence without parole. He had been moved to Corcoran, where it was likely he would be for the rest of his life. Bosch wanted to talk to Acosta for a few reasons. He was suspicious about that first sentence and how Acosta got it. The newspaper accounts were short and didn't mention his attorney or the prosecutor who'd handled the case. Added to this was the new information that Roberto Sanz had been talking to an agent Messesic. Bosch knew that the Bureau investigation likely had to do with the wide-ranging probe of the cliques and corruption that had proliferated inside the sheriff's department. Any focus on Sands and his affiliation with the Cucos would have included a look at the shootout that had made Sands a hero in the department. If Bosch could get Acosta talking, that was what he would ask about. People making unscheduled visits had to fill out a form and then stand by in a waiting room while the inmate was asked if he would agree to the visit. There was no timetable. The corrections officer who Bosch gave the completed form to did not run back into the prison dorms with it to find Acosta. He simply put the form on top of a stack and told Bosch to make himself comfortable in the waiting room and listen for his name to be called. Bosch waited almost two hours and then heard his name. Acosta had agreed to the visit. Bosch knew that was the easy part. The next, getting Acosta to talk to him, was the hard part. He was led to a room where twenty stools and interview booths lined one side and a catwalk ran along the opposite one. A corrections officer walked a back-and-forth circuit watching over the booths. Bosch was instructed to take booth 7. He sat down on a steel stool in front of a thick piece of scratched plexiglass with a telephone receiver on a side hook. He waited another 10 minutes before a thin, wiry man in prison blues showed up on the other side of the glass. The man hesitated, then picked up the phone, but didn't sit down. Bosch picked up his phone. The next 30 seconds would determine if he'd wasted the day. You a cop? Acosta said, You look like a cop. Used to be, Bosch said. Now I work for people like you. Acosta's entire neck was collared in prison ink tattoos that showed his allegiance to La Im, the Mexican mafia that controlled all Latino gangs in California prisons. He had one teardrop tattoo at the corner of his left eye, and his head and face were shaven. He stared at Bosch, curious about his answer. He slowly slid onto his stool. Who are you? he asked. It was on the paper the guard showed you, Bosch said. My name's Bosch. I'm a private investigator. Okay, private investigator, no bullshit. What do you want? I'm trying to get a woman named Lucinda Sands out of prison. You know that name? Can't say I do and I don't care. She was married to the deputy who shot you six years ago. 
You remember now? I remember she did a righteous thing, that lady putting his ass in the ground. I heard about that, but what's it got to do with me? I got a perfect alibi. When that shit went down, I was already in prison, thanks to him and his lying ass. He was lying, then how come he pulled? Let's just say I had no choice, Cabron. I got nothing else to say. He took the phone away from his ear and reached out to hang it up. Bosh held up a finger as if to say one last question. Acosta brought the phone back to his ear. I don't talk to cops or ex-cops, Pandajov, he said. That's not what I heard, Bosch said. Yeah, what did you hear? That you talked to the FBI. Acosta's eyes widened slightly for a moment. That's bullshit, he said. I didn't tell him shit. Acosta's answer confirmed that the Bureau had come to him, whether he had talked or not. Bosch's hunch was looking good. Agent Miss Isaac's report says different, he said. It said she told him what really went down at Flip's hamburger stand that day. Bosch was still working without a net, but he was staying with his hunch that the shootout at Flip's had not happened the way the sheriff's department publicly reported it. Based on what he knew so far about Roberto Sands, he doubted there'd been any heroes that day at Flip's. It was no ambush, was it? He said. Acosta shook his head. I don't talk to cops. I don't talk to FBI. I don't talk to Pendejo private eyes. You talked to Miss Isaac and told him that the ambush wasn't an ambush. It was really a meeting with a corrupt cop that went sideways. That's how you had your sweetheart deal. Acosta took the phone away from his ear again, hesitated, and brought it back. Sweetheart deal, he said. I'm in here for the rest of my fucking life. But it wasn't supposed to be like that, Bosch said. You were supposed to go away for a little while and get out after cooperating with the Bureau. But then Sands got killed, and that was the end of that. And then, of course, you did a prison hit for Laim, and that got you a teardrop in life without parole. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Maybe I don't have the whole picture yet, but I will. I know you talked to Miss Isaac, and I know you got a deal from the feds. You're wrong. My lawyer got me that deal. Silver said I didn't have to cooperate, and I didn't. I just had to keep my mouth shut like I'm doing right fucking now. Bosch stared at Acosta for a long moment before responding. His hunch was paying off, but not in any way he had expected. Your lawyer was Frank Silver? He finally asked. Yeah, that's right, Acosta said. So go talk to him, and you'll find out I'm no fucking snitch. I didn't talk to Miss Isaac or any of them. But you talked to Silver, right? Your attorney. Everything you told him was confidential. You told him about flips? That's how he got the deal. This is over, man. I didn't talk to any of them, and I'm not talking to you. Acosta abruptly hung up the phone, slamming it down on it so so hard that the report in Bosch's ear sounded like a gunshot. Acosta backed off his stool and was gone. Bosch held steady for a long moment, reviewing in his mind what he had just heard. Attorney Frank Silver had represented Angel Acosta the same. Year he'd represented Lucinda Sands. He tried to remember what Lucinda had said about how Silver had come to represent her. He had pushed his way onto the case volunteering to take it off the public defender's hands. Bosch put the phone back on the hook and got up off the stool. He knew there were real coincidences on cases. He didn't believe this was one of them. I found Silver where I had last seen him, behind his desk in his tiny office in the legal commune on Ord Street. I noticed that he had replaced the business card I had taken from the slot on the wall. The door was open like it had been before, but this time I walked in without knocking. Silver didn't look up from what he was writing on a legal pad. The room smelled of Chinese takeout. How can I help you? He said. I didn't answer. I put the staple document down in front of him. He glanced up and did a double take when he saw who stood in front of his desk. The Lincoln lawyer, he said. What's up, partner? You ever go to court, Frank? I asked. I always thought a good lawyer tries to avoid court. Bad shit happens in court, right? Not always. He picked up the document and leaned back in his chair to read it. So what do we have here? He asked. That's a copy of my Habeas petition, I said. I'll file it tomorrow. I thought you should have it in case the media gets wind of it. Lately they seem to be following my cases and my moves pretty closely. That's because you're a winner. And winners get the ink. It's mostly digital now. But I get the point. Silver started to read. Let's see what we've got here, he said. I noticed an open takeout container filled with what looked like fried rice. 
It was giving the claustrophobic room a sharp odor of fried pork. As soon as Silver read the case styling, Sands v. the state of California, he leaned forward and looked up at me. You're going federal with this, he asked. I thought you said. I know what I said, I interrupted. That was before we took a deep dive into the case and found out a few things. I never worked in federal. I try to avoid it, but there are reasons this time. Such as, just keep reading. You'll see. Silver nodded and went back to the document. The top sheet was boilerplate, listing the reasons why the U.S. District Court should hear the motion. The second page was more case-specific and outlined how my efforts to secure cooperation from the FBI for a habeas motion in state court had been thwarted by a blanket denial of requests from the district's U.S. Attorney's Office. Silver nodded as he read as though agreeing to the facts, outlined on page two. When he saw the notation about the attached exhibit, he flipped to the back of the document and read the short, terse letter from the Central District of California U.S. Attorney's Office denying my request to speak to FBI agent Thomas Isaac and warning that any effort to serve him with a state court subpoena would be blocked. Parafact, Silver said, drawing the word out. He went back to the second page and then moved on to page three. This was what I was waiting for. Page three was the meat of the document. It contained the reasons why the petition should be granted and it had bees. Hearing scheduled. I watched closely as Silver continued reading and nodding, acting like he was checking off boxes and approving as he went. But a few seconds later he stopped nodding. What the fuck, Howler? He said. This says ineffective assistance of counsel, and you said you weren't going that way. I told you, things have changed, I said. How the fuck have they changed? You think you're going to file this, and then leak it to the press? That's a big non-starter, buddy boy. That isn't happening. I was still standing. I didn't want to sit down for this. I didn't want to be in this room and in front of this guy any longer than I had to. I put my hands down on his desk after shoving some of the clutter out of the way. I leaned down but was still above Silver's level. Things changed when I found out about you, I said. Me, Silver exclaimed. What are you talking about? Found out what? That you sold Lucinda Sands down the river. That you took a dive? Bullshit. No bullshit. You could have beaten this case easy. But he folded, and that woman's been sitting in China for five years. Are you nuts? None of that is true. I got her a great fucking deal. But even if it was a bad deal, I didn't take it. She did. It was her call. You talked her into it. I didn't have to. She knew they had her, and she knew it was a good deal. I just had to lay it out for her, and she did the rest. You asked her, she'll say the same. I did ask her. She did say it was her call, but she didn't know at the time that a few months earlier he'd represented a client named Angela Costa. Silver failed to keep the surprise out of his eyes. That's right, I said. Angela Costa, the guy your new client's ex-husband shot during a firefight at a hamburger stand. It's not a conflict of interest, Silver said. It's a coincidence. Definitely not in effect. Acosta told you there was no ambush. It was some kind of meeting between the gang and a corrupt cop. I don't know the details yet, but you do. Whatever it was, it went bad fast and the shooting started. Sands was no hero, and you knew it. That was the ace up your sleeve with Acosta. Your leverage. That's how you got him the sweet deal. You threatened to put it all out there, put the sheriff's department on trial. You really don't know what you're talking about, Howler. I think I do. You then saw the opportunity to double dip with Lucinda. Get the case from the public defender, then used the same intel from Acosta to get a deal. But the reality was you had an innocent client, and you met everything you needed to go to trial and win. But no, you're second place, Silver. You took a dive. Silver shoved the food container to the side of his desk, but he pushed too hard, and it fell off and showered the floor and wall with fried rice. Dad and it, he said. He started to bend down to clean it up, but then sat back up straight and looked at me. It was a judgment call, he said. We make them every single day and no judge will grant you a habeas on a judgment call. You file this and you'll be laughed out of federal court. The document I had prepared that morning was simply a prop. Silver was right about one thing. Going for a habeas in federal court with just ineffective assistance of counsel was a non-starter. It would go nowhere and I wasn't planning to file it. It was just a tool to help me get to Silver and get him talking. I might be laughed out of court, I said, or the public might learn that you took a dive on an innocent client's case. As I said, 
You don't know what the fuck you're talking about, Silver said. Then here's your chance to school me, Frank. Tell me what I don't know. I was fucking threatened, you dumbass. I had no choice. There, I had broken through. Now I pulled out the chair in front of his desk and sat down. Threatened by who? I said. I can't get into it, he said. The threat is still out there, and it's real. You need to be careful or it will be your ass in a sling next. Wrong answer. You need to get into it right now or I'll file it in the morning and put a press release onto every newsroom in the city. You can't do this to me. I pointed to the document on the desk in front of him. It's already done. You want to stop it. Tell me what went down with Sands. Who threatened you and why? Jesus Christ. Silver shook his head like a man who sees no way out of a trap. There's only one choice here, Frank, I said. You're working with me, or you're working against me. And I will burn the ground you walk on to get my client out of that prison. All right, all right, Silver said. I'll tell you what happened, okay, but you need to treat it as intel. You can't reveal who you got it from. I can't make that promise. Not until I know what you know. Fuck. He was stalling. I pushed my chair back. Okay, I'm out of here. Good luck tomorrow. No, 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 wait. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. You were right, Angel told me everything. Sands was a collector for this sheriff's gang who called themselves the Kukos. Acosta and his gang were paying for protection, and Sands was the bagman. That date was supposed to be a regular cash pickup. But then Sands upped the ant. The Kukos wanted more. There was an argument, and it turned into a shootout. After Angel told me that, a friend of Sansa's called me and said that if I went into court with what I knew, it would be the last case I ever tried. A friend? Who are we talking about? I don't know. One of the Kukos. That doesn't help me. I need a name. I don't have a name. I didn't want a name. I'll protect you. Are you fucking kidding me? You can't protect me from them. They're cops. How did you know they were cops? I just did. It was obvious, wasn't it? With what it cost and it told me. I still need a name, Frank, or we're done here. Who called you? He didn't say his name and I didn't ask for it. What exactly did he say? He told me to tell Acosta that if he kept his mouth shut, he'd get a deal from the DA. I said fine. I knew bidding him a deal would be a big victory. And so did Acosta. I didn't have to sell it. He was happy to take it. Who was the prosecutor who offered the deal? Satan one who handled all the heavy cases out there. Andrea Fontaine. But she's downtown now. I considered everything just said and then moved on. Okay, I said. Lucinda Sands, you went to the PD and took the case. Because I was told to, Silver said. By who? The same one who called you on Acosta. No, this time it was a woman. She knew about the whole Acosta deal. And she said there would be an offer from Fontaine. She told me to make Lucinda take the deal and plead her out and that if I used what I knew about Roberto Sands and the shootout from before, I was a dead man, plain and simple. I thought about this. Lucinda had said a woman had conducted the GSR test on her, a woman who said she worked with Roberto Sands. The second caller, do you know who it was, I asked. No, man, I told you, Silver said. No names were mentioned. They weren't that stupid. Did Lucinda know about any of this? Silver lowered his eyes. I never told her, he said, I just told her to take the deal. That it was the only way. I thought I could see shame and regret in Silver's eyes. Maybe he had believed at the time that Lucinda was guilty as charged and that the callers were putting a cap on what could blow up into another scandal for the sheriff's department. But either way Silver knew deep inside that he'd never been more than a hack lawyer from the Ward Street Commune. You did all this based on phone calls from nameless people who claimed they were cops, I said. But how did you know the threats were legit? Because they knew things, Silver said. Things that had never gotten out, that had to have come from the inside. Like what? Like they knew what Acosta could spill if I put him on the stand. That, Roberto Sands was no fucking hero the day at the shootout. I changed direction with Silver, using Bosch's tactic of keeping a witness off balance with unexpected questions. Tell me about Agent Mesosic, I said. Who? Silver asked. Through a few phone calls, Bosch had been able to learn Mesozic's full name and posting in the Bureau's Oifield office. That part of the document was fact and I was hopeful it would draw a response from Silver. FBI Special Agent Tom Mesozic, I said. 
He's the guy the U.S. attorney won't allow me to talk to or subpoena. Did he ever show up around here to talk to you? No, I never heard of him till now. What's his? He had a lengthy meeting with Roberto Sanz on the day he was killed. If you were any kind of an attorney, you would have found that out and not talked your client into a plea deal. Silver shook his head. Look, man, I keep telling you, I was threatened, he said. I had no choice. So you turned around and gave your client no choice, I said. You talked her into the plea. You talked her into prison. You weren't there, man. You have no idea what kind of pressure was on me and what evidence they had on her. She was going down either way. Sure, Frank. Whatever lets you sleep at night. I had an almost overwhelming desire to hit away from Frank Silver in his office, which stank of failure and pork fried rice. But I stayed to hear him finish his confession. All right, I said. Go back to me, Angel Acosta, and tell me everything you know. I need every detail you can remember. You do that in this motion, Netter gets filed. I pointed to the prop doc on his desk. How do I know you won't fuck me over in the end? Silver asked. Well, buddy boy, I said, I guess you don't. The Lincoln was at the curb, bosh behind the wheel. When I came out, I had completely broken the habit of jumping in the back, and I got in the front seat without a second thought. Did it work? Bosch asked. Yes and no, I said. He pretty much confirmed what we had already put together. But he said he didn't know anything about Miss Isaac or the FBI. Do you believe him? I do. For now. Well, what did he know? He said that on both the Acosta and Sands cases he was threatened by deputies. First he had to get Acosta to take a deal, then later the same thing, all over again with Lucinda. He didn't have names. It was all on his phone. One call from a male, a second from a female. Each time he was told that the DA would come across with an offer and his client had to take it or there would be consequences. For him. Just that. Anonymous phone calls. Each time the caller had inside information. New details about the shootout with Sands. He believed the threat. One caller male, the other female. Lucinda says it was a woman who did the GSR. What I was thinking. For now, we call her Lady X but we need to identify everybody who was in Sands' unit at the time, especially any women. Between you and Cisco, run them down, full bios, and we'll start building a witness list. Got it. Where to now? Hall of Justice. Time to rattle a cage over there. Bosch checked the mirrors and then pulled the Lincoln away from the curb on Ord Street. Whose cage? Bosch asked. The deputy DA who handled both the Acosta and Sands cases is Andrea Fontaine. Back then, she was assigned to the Antelope Valley Courthouse. Now she's downtown in major crimes. I was thinking we'd pay her a visit and see what she has to say about those cases and the deals she made on them. Looks to me like she might have made a deal for herself. You're talking major conspiracy here. The Sheriff's Department and the DA's office. Hey, man, conspiracy theories are a defense lawyer's bread and butter. Great. What about the truth? You don't find that too often in the courtrooms I've been in. Bosch had no comeback for that. It took us five minutes to get to the Hall of Justice and another ten to find a parking spot. Before we got out, Bosch finally spoke. What you said about building a witness list. What do you expect to get from Sansa's teammates? I expect them to get on the stand and lie their asses off about this. They do and we take out the biggest piece of evidence against Lucinda. The GSR? Now you're thinking like a defense attorney. Never. Look, do you believe that Lucinda killed her ex and is where she should be right now? Bosch thought a moment before answering. Come on, I said. You're not under oath. I don't think she did it, he finally said. Well, neither do I, so what we gotta do is knock down the evidence against her like dominoes. And if we can't do that, then we have to own it and explain it. They come up with photos of her shooting at targets, then we own it and say yes, that's her but she was doing that because she couldn't shoot for shit and certainly not well enough to put two bullets in her exhaust bands back nearly six inches apart. Like that. You get it. I did. Good. Now, let's go see what this prosecutor has to say. You're going to ask about this. The GSR? Yeah, without giving anything away. Bosch nodded, and we opened our doors and got out. The Hall of Justice was across from the criminal court's building. It had at one time housed the sheriff's department, and its top three floors were the county jail. But then the sheriff's department moved most of its operations, 
out to the STOR Center in Whittier, and a county jail was built. The building was repurposed and the jail floors were turned into offices for prosecutors who worked cases in the courtrooms across the street. Andrea Fontaine was not welcoming of our unscheduled visit. She met us in a waiting area after being notified by the receptionist of our request for an audience. We introduced ourselves and she walked us back to her office, explaining that she had only a few minutes before she needed to leave for a hearing in a courtroom across the street. That's okay, I said. We only need a few minutes. She walked us into an office that was smaller than Frank Silver's and clearly had once been a cell. Three walls of concrete block and a fourth behind her desk that was a latticework of iron bars and glass with no opening bigger than six inches square. The office was neat and not as cramped as Silver's. There was room for two chairs in front of her desk and we all sat down. I don't think we have a case together, do we? Fatin asked. Uh, not yet, I said. That sounds mysterious. What's this about? Two cases you handled during your Antelope Valley days. I was moved down here four years ago. Which cases? Angel Acosta, Musinda Sands. I'm sure they're on your greatest hits list. Fontaine tried to keep a poker face, but I could see the flare of fear enter her eyes. I remember Sands, of course, she said. She killed a deputy I actually knew. It's rare you get a case where you know the victim. And Acosta. Help me with that one. It rings a bell, but I can't place it. The ambush at the Flipsburger stand the year before Sands was killed. I said, The shootout? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Why are you asking about those cases? They were both closed with dispositions. Guilty people pleading guilty. Well, we're not so sure about that. The guilty part. On which one? Lucinda Sands. You're going to challenge that conviction? She got a great deal. You want to risk getting a redo? If we go to trial, she could end up with a life. Sentence. With what she's got now, she'll be out in, what, four or five more years? Maybe even sooner. Four and a half, actually. But she says she didn't do it. And she wants out now. And you believe her? Yeah, I do. Fontaine turned her eyes to Bosch. What about you, Bosch? She asked. You were homicide. Doesn't matter what I believe, Bosch said. The evidence isn't there for conviction. Then why did she plead guilty? Fontaine asked. Because she had no choice, I said. And actually, she pled Nolo. There's a difference. Fontaine just stared at us for a few moments. Gentlemen, we're done here, she finally said. I have nothing more to say about those cases. They're closed. Justice was done. And I'm going to be late for court. She started sacking files on her desk and getting ready to go. I'd rather talk now than have to sapuni you, I said. Well, good luck with that, Fontaine said. The most damning piece of evidence you had on her was the GSR. I'll tell you right now, we can blow that up. You're a defense lawyer. You can find a so-called expert to say whatever you want. But over here, we deal in facts, and the fact is she shot her ex-husband and is where she deserves to be. She stood up and dumped her gathered files into a leather bag with initials in gold near the handle. Bosch started to stand up, but I didn't. I'd hate to see you drag through the shit that's about to come out, I said. When this gets to court, is that a threat? Fontaine asked. It's more like a choice. Work with us to find the truth. Or work against us and hide it. That'll be today when I find a defense attorney really interested in the truth. Now you need to go or I'm going to call security to escort you out. I took my time standing up, holding her angry stare as I did. Just remember, I said, we gave you the choice. Just go, she said loudly, now. Bosch and I didn't speak until we were on the elevator going down. I'd say you succeeded in rattling her cage, Bosch said. Hers and a few others down the line, I'm sure, I said. Are we ready for that? What happened to no footprints? Changing course, besides, somebody out there already knows what we're doing. How do you know that? Easy, somebody broke into your house because they wanted us to know. Bosch nodded, and we were silent while the old elevator made its way down. When we stepped out into the lobby, Bosch brought up what I had been mulling over myself. So he said, Fontaine, think she's bent or is she a victim? Good question, I said. They threatened the defense attorney into doing what they wanted. Maybe they did it with the prosecutor, too. Or maybe she's just as corrupt as the Cucos. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. She was pressured into protecting the sheriff's department from scandal. It is, after all, the sister agency to the DA's office. 
I think you're being too kind, Harry. You gotta remember, two years after this shit went down, she gets a transfer from Antelope Fucking Valley to Major Crimes downtown. That feels like a payoff to me. True, I guess. We can't guess. We have to have it down solid before we get into court. You'll subpoena her as a witness. Not with what we know now. Too many things that aren't clear. It would be too dangerous to bring her in. No telling what she'd say on the stand. We pushed through the heavy doors onto Temple Street and headed back to the Lincoln. I wanted to get home so I could start writing the real petition that I would file on behalf of Lucinda Sands. No more props, no more games. It was time to put together the narrative that would make the case for my client's actual innocence. As I had told Lucinda, the world was turned upside down. She was not considered guilty until proven innocent. The initial document I would write in the next few days needed to make clear, without giving away the store, what I would present and what I would prove. It needed to do more than shade cages in the sheriff's department. It had to be compelling enough to make a U.S. District Court judge sit up in his or her comfortable chambers and say, I want to hear more. I had at least two solid things going for me at this point that were not her said or otherwise dismissible. One was the revelation that Roberto Sands was in a sheriff's clique, which brought a clear implication of organized corruption. The other was the meeting between Sands and an FBI agent just an hour before his murder. That was new evidence that pointed to a wide range of suspects other than Lucinda Sands. I believed that these could get me through to Habib's door. But I knew I would need more, much more, once I had through. I told Bosch to take me home. He had his own assignment, identify the other members of Roberto Sanz's unit, especially any female deputies. He needed to put a name to Lady X. Bosch pulled to the curb on fair home by the stairs to my front door. So I'm round if you need me, he said. I'll let you know when I have the crew names put together. You know where to find me, I said. I cleared my schedule to write. I stopped mid-sentence when I looked up the stairs to the front door. What is it? Bosch asked. My front door is open, I said. Those bastards. So we both got out and proceeded cautiously up the steps to the deck. I don't have a weapon, Bosch announced. Good, I said. I don't want another shooting in here. More than fifteen years earlier, I had exchanged fire in my home with a woman intent on killing me. It was the one and only gunfight I'd ever been in. I had won it, and I wasn't interested in risking a perfect record. Besides, I doubt there's anyone inside, have I added, like at your place? They're just sending a message. We know about you. We're watching you. Whoever they are, Bosch said. I entered first and found the front room empty and undisturbed. It was a small house with a big view, on the other side of the hills from Bosch's place. Living room, dining room, and kitchen were in the front, and two bedrooms and an office were in the back. The backyard was barely big enough for a deck, and the hot tub I never used. As we moved through, I saw no signs of a break-in. We saw nothing out of place until we moved down the hallway and reached the office. The intruders had left the room in shambles. Drawers pulled out of the desk and overturned on the floor. Couch upholstery slashed with a blade. Law books knocked off shelves. The coup de grace came from a bottle of maple syrup I'd brought back from a trip to Montreal with my daughter the year before. I had left it on a shelf as a reminder of the fun we'd had. Now it was shattered on the floor, its contents having been poured onto the keyboard of the laptop, Line open next to the shards of glass. With you, they only made you think there was a break-in, right? I asked. That or made me think I was losing my mind, Bosch said. Well, I would rather have had that than this. Yeah, did you call it in? Did you? I made a report. You told me to. But nothing's going to come of it. I get the feeling that's what they want me to do. How so? I don't know. It's their plan, not mine but I don't have time to deal with a police investigation that won't lead to anything. They want to distract me. Who is they? I don't know. The Kukos, the FBI. It could be anybody at this point. We've obviously poked the hornet's nest. I scanned the entire room, surveying the damage. I need to figure out what they took, I said, and go to the Apple store. With a foot, I shoved the laptop a few feet across the floor. It left a trail of maple syrup. This one is done, I said, but I've got everything on the cloud. I'll be back in business as soon as I pick up a new one. What makes you think they took something? Bosch asked. I spread my hands to take in the whole ransacked room. They were covering something up by trashing the place, I said. Something they found? Bosch didn't respond. 
You don't think so? I asked. Not sure, he said. Could have been a lot of things. First of all, we don't know this has anything to do with the Sands case. I'm sure you've made your fair share of enemies over the years. It could be unrelated to Sands. Don't kid yourself, Bosch. We both had break-ins just days apart. What's the connection? Sands. This is them. Believe me. And it's not going to stop us. Fuck them. This will just make it taste all the better when we take them down and Lucinda does the resurrection walk. Resurrection walk? When she is raised from the dead. Okay. He looked a little baffled by the term. You gotta make sure you're there for that, Harry, I said. That will be something. You get her out, I'll be there, he said. B-O-C-H-W-S, L-Y-N-G chest down, his left cheek on the dry scrub grass that had sprouted in the yard after the torrential rains of last winter. It was now, October, and the grass had dried to a yellow-brown over the summer months. Each blade was crisp and felt like a knife's edge against his skin. He'd heard the woman's voice from behind him. Okay, both hands at your sides, palms up, she said. There was no effort to break his fall. He was essentially dead before he hit the ground. Bosch adjusted his hands accordingly. Like that, he asked. Oh, move your right about four inches farther out from your body, she said. No, left. Sorry, I meant your left hand four inches farther out. Bosch adjusted. Perfect, she said. She was Shami Arslanian, a forensics expert Mickey Haller had brought out from New York. The hearing on the Lucinda Sands Abyss petition was a week away, and Arslanian had come out to prep for her presentation and testimony. Bosch had brought her to the scene of the crime, the front lawn, where Roberto Sands had been fatally shot twice in the back. She had determined that Bosch was within an inch of Sans's height and twenty pounds of his weight, so Bosch would be Sans's stand-in, actually his lie-in. She set up a camera with a laser focus on a tripod. Okay, she said. Almost done. No worries, Bosch said. Just glad we aren't doing this in the summer. His breath kicked up a puff of desert dust. Okay, got it, she said. We're good. Bosch rolled to his side and started to get up. You sure, he asked. Actually, stay like that, on your knees, she said. Let me capture that while we're here. Just turn to your left about forty-five degrees. Moving on his knees, Bosch turned. Arslanian tweaked his position, slightly, and then told him to drop his hands and ply to his sides. He did so, and she told him to hold still. Okay, she said. Do you need help getting all the way up? No, I'm good, he said. He got to one knee and pushed himself up. He started brushing the dust and loose scrub grass off his clothes. He was wearing jeans and a patterned shirt with the tails out. Sorry about your clothes, Arslanian said. Don't be, Bosch said, part of the job. I had a feeling I would get dirty out here. But I'm sure your job description doesn't include playing dead. You'd be surprised. Driver, investigator, subpoena service. I've worked for Haller for nine months or so, and there's always a new job within the job. You know, I do. This is my third case with him. I never know what to expect when he calls me. Bosch walked over to where she was taking the camera and laser mount off the tripod. She, too, was wearing blue jeans and a work shirt with several pens and a breast pocket. She was short and compact, her body shape largely hidden beneath the baggy shirt she wore untucked. And she was newly blonde, which Bosch had learned when he picked her up at the airport. The day before. Initially, he looked around baggage claim for a woman whom Haller had described as a redhead. So with all of this, you're going to make a recreation of the shooting? He asked. Exactly, Arslanian said. We'll be able to show the murder as close to the way it happened as possible. Amazing. It's a program that I was involved in developing. It can be tweaked, according to height, distance, all physical parameters. What I call the forensic physics of a case. Bosch wasn't sure what all of that meant, though he did know artificial intelligence was a controversial subject, depending on the application. It reminded him of when people first started talking about DNA in law enforcement. It took a while for the technology to be accepted, but now it was considered, wrongly or rightly, to be the easy solve for violent crimes. I like what I do, Arslanian said. It's fun to figure out exactly how something happened and why. I get that, Bosch said. How long were you a cop? About 40 years. Wow. And military before that? Do you know what the high ready gun stance is? Sure. That's what we're going to show. When Lucinda was married to Roberto, 
he taught her to shoot. He took her to the range, and there are photos of her in high-ready stance. That's what I'll base this on. Okay. Bosch had seen the photos in the discovery material, Haller got at their file and need a beast petition, and he knew that at first glance they weren't helpful to the case for Lucinda Sands's innocence. He wasn't sure how Arslanian's recreation would work, but he knew that Haller had full trust in her. And he remembered Haller talking about taking adverse evidence and finding ways to own it, make it work for you rather than against you. The photos of Lucinda at the range had seemed damning. But maybe now, not so much. I'm going out to China tomorrow to show Lucinda some photos, Bosch said. Do you need me to ask her anything? I don't think so, Arslanian said. I think we're covered. And I've got what I need here. We can head back to the city, and I'll get to work on it. Sounds like a plan, Bosch said. I'm just going to tell the owners we're done. Bosch walked up the stoop to the front door and knocked. A woman quickly answered, and Bosch got the idea that she had been watching them through a window. Mrs. Perez, we're all done here, Bosch said. Thanks for letting us use the front yard. Is okay, Perez said. Oh, you said you work for the lawyer? Yes, we both do. Do you think the woman is innocent? I do, but we have to prove it. Okay, I see. Do you know her? Oh, no, I don't. I just, I just wondered what would happen. Okay. Bosch waited to see if she would say more, but she didn't. Well, thank you, he said. He went down the two steps and joined Arslanian in the yard. She had collapsed her tripod and was stowing it in a carrying bag. When she bought the house, did she know what happened here? She asked. She's just renting, Bosch said. Her landlord didn't tell her. Was she freaked out when you told her? Not so much. It's a lady, no. There's probably a history of violence wherever you go. That's sad. That's a lay. On T-H-E-D-R-I-V-E back from the desert, Arslanian didn't have to be told to sit up front. She took the seat next to Bosch, but focused her attention on her notes and a laptop she opened once they were on the smooth surface of the Antelope Valley Freeway. She spoke without taking her eyes off the screen or interrupting the input of data into her computer program. Funny that they call it the Antelope Valley, she said. Why is that? Bosch asked. I did my research on the plane. There hadn't been any antelope here in over a century. The species was hunted out by the indigenous people before it. It was ever called the Antelope Valley. Didn't know that. I was thinking I might see antelope roaming free. But then I, I looked it up. Bosch nodded and tried to draw her attention away from the computer screen. Do you see that? He said. The rock outcropping. Arslanian looked up at the jagged formation that were passing to the north of the freeway. Wow, beautiful, she said, and immense. Vasquez rocks, Bosch said. They call it that because about 150 years ago a bandito named Tiburcio Vasquez hid out in there and the sheriff's paws never found him. Arslanian studied the formation for a long moment before responding. Not many places are named after bad guys, she said. How about Trump Tower? Bosch responded. Self-named, and I guess it depends on whom you talk to about that. I guess so. She lapsed into silence and Bosch wondered if he had offended her. He had just been trying for some kind of reaction. He was intrigued by her and the way she did her work and looked at things. He wanted to know her better, but knew her time in Lolly would be short. After the hearing, she would return to New York. When, after a few minutes, they had connected to the Golden State. Freeway, she spoke again. Mickey told me you two were brothers. Half-brothers, actually. Ah, which was the common parent? Father. But you two didn't know about each other until you were grown up? Yeah, our father was a lawyer like Mickey. Mickey's mother was his wife. My mother was a client. I think I see why you were kept apart. Was it consensual, your mother and father? It was a surprising question. Bosch didn't answer at first because he realized he had never asked himself that. It was not too late to ever know for sure. I'm sorry, you don't have to talk about it, Arslanian said. Sometimes, I'm too blunt with people I feel comfortable with. No, it's not that, Bosch said. I just never thought about it that way before. I'd assumed it was consensual. Started as a business arrangement. Payment for services rendered. My mother was gone by the time I figured out who he was, and I met him only once and very briefly at that. He was dying at the time, and soon afterward he was gone too. I'm sorry. 
Nothing really to be sorry about. I didn't know the guy. I mean, sorry, you had to grow up like that. Bosch just nodded. She moved on. So how'd you and Mickey meet? One of those DNA services? No, it was a case. We met on a case and sort of figured it out. Harry, can I ask you something? Something personal? Seems like all you ask are personal questions. True. I guess that's just me. So go ahead. Ask away. Are you ill? The question caught Bosch off guard. His vanity had led him to believe she was going to ask whether he was married. It took a few moments for him to form a response. Mickey told you that? Oh no, no, I just could tell. Your aura. It feels weakened, you could say. My aura? Well, I was sick, but I'm getting better. Sick how? Cancer, but like I said, it's under control. No, you said you were getting better? That could mean something, different from under control. I assume you are under care. What kind of cancer is it, or was it? It's called CNO for short. Chronic myeloid leukemia. That's not a hereditary cancer. It comes from chromosomal changes. Any idea how? I'm sorry, I should be asking you this. The freeway traffic became clogged and slowed down as they dropped back into Los Angeles at the top of the valley. It's okay, Bosch said. I worked a case where I got exposed to radioactive material. I didn't know it until it was too late. Anyway, it could have been that, but it could have been a lot of things. I used to smoke. Diagnosing origin is not an exact science. I'm sure as a person of science, you know that? Arslanian nodded. You said both that the cancer is under control and that you're getting better, she said. Which is it? You'd have to have asked my doctor, Bosch said. Mickey got me into a clinical trial. That's why I've been working for him. Health insurance and the access he has to the upper levels of medical care. Anyway, the doctor in charge of the trial said the treatment they tested on me worked. To an extent. It was not full remission, but close. They want to do it again and hopefully knock the rest of it out. I hope so, too. Where did you go for this trial? UCLA Med. Arslanian nodded her approval. That's a good facility, she said. Would you allow me to take a DNA sample from you? Why? Bosch asked. It could give us further insight into what's going on with you, biologically. Did they run genetic tests on you at UCLA? Not that I know of. I don't ask them about everything they're doing. It's kind of above my pay grade. But they sure took a lot of blood. Of course, but you might ask them. It could be part of the clinical trial. If not, I'd like to do it. Why? Is this something Mickey wants from me? You are such a detective, Harry Bosch. No, Mickey knows nothing about this. But I would also go to him for a DNA sample. Since you're half-brothers, you have very similar genomes. A comparison might be beneficial to you both. Have you heard of precision medicine? Oh, no, not really. It's got a lot to do with genetic makeup and targeting care and treatment. Do you have children? A daughter? Same as Mickey. This could be beneficial to them as well. Bosch had always been suspicious of science and technology. Not that he didn't believe that the advances made were good for the world, but he had a detective suspicion about early adopters and didn't buy into the cult-like belief that all scientific discoveries were beneficial. He knew this put him on the outside looking in, an analog man in a digital world, but his instincts had always served him well. For every great technological advancement, there were always people out there looking to misuse it. I'll think about it, he said, thanks for the offer. Anytime, Arslanian said, they rode in silence most of the way downtown. It became awkward and Bosch tried to come up with something to say. So, he finally managed. What have you been doing with the computer? There. Just plugging the data into the recreation program, Arslanian said. It will do the work and then in court, it will be my job to show and tell. Light is for you, this is new stuff for juries. We'll just have a judge making the call and a bees. No jury. Same thing. Judges need to be schooled too. I'm sure you'll be a good teacher. Thanks. I'm in the process of patenting the program. I'm sure prosecutors and defense attorneys all over the country will be jumping on this. That's why I need to protect it. Not to keep them from using it, but to protect the investment of time, money, and research my partner in NIT, and I put into it. Bosch pulled into the entrance tunnel of the Conrad Hotel and lowered his window to tell the valid, who rushed up that he was just dropping off his passenger. Thank you, Harry, Arslanian said. I enjoyed our conversation and I hope you think about precision medicine. 
her door was opened by the helpful valet, and she got out. I guess I'll see you in court, Bosch said. I'll be there, Arslanian said. The valet unloaded Arslanian's equipment from the back seat and Bosch pulled out into traffic. He wished he had said more to her, maybe asked if she wanted to get dinner. He felt embarrassed. As old as he was, he still hesitated to pull the trigger on matters of the heart. The shift boss at the prison denied Bosch's request for an attorney-client meeting room because Bosch was not an attorney. He had to make a regular visitation request and then wait two hours before he heard his name, called up for a loudspeaker. He was ushered to a stool in front of a thick plexiglass window in a long line of stools and visitation booths very similar to the setup at Corcoran. The wait for Lucinda Sands wasn't long after that. They both took their phones off the books and spoke. Hello, Mr. Bosch. Hello, Cindy. Call me Harry. Okay, Harry. Is it over? Is what over? Did the judge turn Mr. Haller down? Oh, no, nothing's over. The hearing is happening. It's this coming Monday. They'll be transporting you to the city for it. Bosch saw a little bit of life return to rise. She had been prepared for the worst. I'm here because I want to show you some photos, he said. Remember you told us that it was a female deputy who wiped her hands and arms for gunshot residue? Yes, woman, Lucinda said. I have some photos. I want to see if you recognize any of them as the woman who swabbed you. Okay. They wouldn't let us meet in an attorney room with a table where I could spread them out like a lineup, so I'm going to hold up the photos one at a time. I want you to study all of them before you respond. Even if you're sure about a photo, wait till I show you all six. Take your time. And then if you recognize one, you tell me by number one through six. Okay? Okay. All right, here goes. Bosch hung up the phone to make sure he would not hear Lucinda as she blurted out a number or other exclamation before he had shown her all the photos. He opened a manila file on the shelf in front of the window. The six photos were face down in a stack. Each had a number written on the back. He held them up to the glass one at a time did a silent five-second count, then lowered the photo and went on to the next. Lucinda leaned toward the glass to look closely at them. Bosch watched her eyes and saw recognition when he held up the fourth photo. It was immediate and clear. But Lucinda, who had let her phone hang loose on its cord, did not make any exclamation. The photos were not face shots. They were surveillance shots taken surreptitiously with a long lens camera handled by Sisko Wojcikowski. It had taken him nearly a week outside the Antelope Valley Sheriff's Station with a camera and a radio scanner to identify and photograph the members of the anti-gang task force that at one time included Roberto Sands. There were only two women currently on the team, and only one of them had been in the unit when Roberto Sands was assigned to it. Her photo was among the six Bosch was now showing Lucinda. The other women in the photos were of similar age and shown in similar candid situations, but none of them were sheriff's deputies. None were in uniform. When he was finished showing them, he put the photos back in the file and closed it. He picked up the phone. Do you want me to show them again? He asked. Number four, Lucinda said. That's her. Four. Are you sure? Bosch said. Do you want to look again? He kept his voice as deadpan as possible. No, it's her, Lucinda said. She's the one. I remember. She's the deputy who wiped your hands and your clothes with the GSR pads? Bosch asked. Yes. And you're sure? Yes, four. Percentage-wise, how sure are you? One hundred percent. It's her. Who is she? Bosch leaned toward the glass to take in as much of Lucinda's side of the booth as possible. He looked past her shoulder and up. He saw the camera mounted on the upper wall that ran behind the booths where the convicts talked to their visitors. Lucinda's identification of Stephanie Sanger would be on video if needed. Lucinda turned around, following Bosch's sightline to the camera. She looked back at him. What? she asked. Nothing, really, Bosch said, just wanted to see if there was a camera. Why? In case the identification you'd made is challenged in court. You mean like if I'm not there? Do you think I'm in danger because I identified her? Lucinda suddenly looked scared. No, I don't think that, he said quickly to reassure her. I'm just covering all the bases. Normally these are done in a room without glass between us and you signed your name to the photo you pick. We can't do that here. That's all. Nothing's going to happen to you, Cindy. Are you sure? She asked. I'm sure. I just want everything to be bulletproof for when we get to court. Okay, I trust you and Mr. Howler. 
Thank you. Who I picked, who is she? Her name is Stephanie Sanger. She worked with your ex-husband. Yes, she told me that. Do you remember what else she said? She just said they had to do the test so they could rule me out. That was a trick to get you to do it. Bosch picked up the file containing the photos and held it up. When we go to court next week, you may be asked about this, okay? Why? What I mean is you may have to make the identification again. By photo? Or if she's there? She'll be there. She may be yes, we're going to subpoena her as a witness. But I don't know for sure whether she'll be in court if you testify. When will they move me to LA? I'm not sure about that either. I'll get Mr. Haller to check on it. I don't want to be held in the county jail. The sheriffs run that. You won't be. It's a federal case. You'll be transferred from here to federal custody. The U.S. Marshals Service. So they can bring you to court on Monday. You're sure. A loud buzz sounded in the phone's earpiece, followed by an electronic voice stating that the interview had one minute left. I'm sure, Cindy. Bosch said. Don't worry about that. A look of desperation came over her face as she realized the final seconds of the interview were ticking away. Mr. Bosch, are you going to win? She said. We're going to do our best, Bosch said, immediately knowing his words were inadequate. The truth will come out and we're going to get you home to your son. Do you promise me? Bosch hesitated, but before he could answer, the connection went dead. He just looked at Lucinda Sands and nodded. He knew as he did so that it was a promise that would haunt him if things didn't turn out the way he hoped. He got up from the stool and gave Lucinda a half-hearted wave goodbye. She did the same and her face showed the uncertainty of what lay ahead. Promises or no promises, nothing was for sure in court. He followed the arrows on the floor to the prison's exit gate. He felt bad about how the interview had ended but tried to concentrate on what had been accomplished. She had identified Stephanie Sanger as the one who started the chain reaction that resulted in Lucinda Sands being charged with her ex-husband's murder. That was a big get, and as soon as he got to the prison's parking lot, he turned his phone back on and called Haller. The call rang through to voicemail. Bosch guessed that Haller was in court. He started to leave a message, but heard a beep, and saw that Haller was calling him back. He ended the message and tipped the call. So what's happening in China? Haller said. Cindy identified Sanger as the one who conducted the GSR test, Bosch said. Haller whistled. Bosch could hear traffic noises and guessed that he was in the Lincoln. This is good, Haller said. It's what we thought, but nice to have it on the record. Sort of, Bosch said. They wouldn't give me the loiter room. I had to show her the photos through the glass. She couldn't sign the photo, but there was a camera behind her. It's on video, if we ever need it. Good. Anything else? She's nervous, especially about Sanger. Afraid? Well, we're six days out. I'd say it's time to initiate our plan. Subpoena Sanger. And her pal Mitchell. Yeah, they're not going to like it. That's an understatement. I also want you to pick up the thumb drive ADT and T has been holding for us. Doesn't it become discovery the minute I do? Technically, it's not discoverable until I decide I'm going to present it in court. But if I wait and sandbag him with it the day before, they'll scream bloody murder and get a continuance from the judge. So what do we do? You pick it up, download the data, then print out the entire file. Should be a couple thousand pages, I'm guessing. Then we give them the hard copy. While you keep the searchable electronic file. My guess is they'll look at that haystack and think we're scamming them into wasting time on it and they'll have no valid complaint when we put it into evidence. If we put it into evidence. That's a big if. We have our hunches about what you'll find, but it's all been out to pan out where we've wasted our time and our client's chance at freedom. Well, I'll get to work on the cell data as soon as I have it. Let me know what you get. Wait, what about the FBI? I'm not going to play that card until I have to. Bosch wasn't exactly sure what that meant, but he knew not to ask further questions about it. Haller was trying to play hide the ball with the attorney general's office, handing over what he had to, but only when he had to in disguising his court strategy as best he could. It was a high wire, act with no net that could ultimately come down to an angry federal judge, wanting to know what he knew and when he'd known it. It was the kind of defense ploy that would have made Bosch's blood boil when he carried a badge. Now he almost admired Haller for the moves he was making. He saw the Lincoln lawyer as a master at staying just inside the ethical boundary lines when it came to dealings with those sitting across the aisle. Haller called it dancing between the raindrops. 
In the seven months they had worked the Sands case together, Bosch had come to realize that working on the defense side made Hallard the long-shot underdog. He was like a man on the beach holding a surfboard and looking up at a hundred-foot wave coming in. The power and might of the state was limitless. Haller was just one man making a stand for his client. He was willing to paddle out to that crushing wave. Bosch was beginning to see that there was something noble in that. You've heard anything from Morris yet? Bosch asked. We're still good to go Monday. Hayden Morris was the assistant attorney general for California, who would defend the conviction of Lucinda Sands at the federal Habeas hearing. He had made little contact with Hadler other than sending him a note every Monday morning demanding full discovery. Not a word, Hadler said. So as far as I'm concerned, all systems are go for Monday. Be there we square. Got it, Bosch said. I'll pick up the AT and, and T stuff on my way in. I'll dive in tonight and then go paper Sanger and Mitchell tomorrow. If you find what we hope is in there, you call me right away. But remember, no emails, no texts. Right. Nothing you'll have to turn over to the AG. There you go. You're thinking like a defense lawyer again. I hope not. Embrace it. It's the new year. Bosch disconnected without further comment or denial. The eagle had angry, righteous eyes. It looked as if, given the opportunity, it would drop the arrows and olive branch it grasped in its sharp talons, swoop down from the wall, and tear your throat open for having even thought of coming here for justice. I studied it as I grew accustomed to my new surroundings. I had spent most of my decades-long practice trying to avoid being in federal courtrooms. The U.S. District Court for the Central District of California was where defense cases went to die. The feds operated with a near 100% conviction rate. Defense cases, here were managed, not often tried and almost never won. But Lucinda Sands v. the state of California was different. A habeas petition was a civil motion. My opponent wasn't the federal government. I was in a battle against the state, with a federal judge presiding as referee. And that opened the door of hope. After I took in the seal with the angry eagle affixed to the wall above the judge's bench, my eyes moved about the august room with its deep, rich woods, flags in the front corners, and textured oil portraits of former jurists on the side walls. This room had stood the test of time better than any lawyer who had ever stepped in here with a prayer for justice. This was what Legal Siegel had taught me so long ago. Breathe it in. This is your moment. This is your stage. Want it. Own it. Take it. I closed my eyes and repeated the words in my head, ignoring the sounds round me, people shuffling into the benches of the gallery behind me, whispers from the AG's table to my left, the court clerk and his quarrel muttering into his phone to the right, and then came an intrusion I could not ignore. Mickey, Mickey. An urgent whisper. I opened my eyes and looked at Lucinda. She nodded toward the back of the room. I turned and saw the reporters in the first row and the courtroom artist working for one of the TV stations, since cameras were not allowed in federal court. And beyond them, I saw Deputy Stephanie Sanger sitting in the last row. It was the first time I had seen her in person. Since the abuse was a civil motion, I could have deposed her, but that would have given her, and the AG, a heads up on my case strategy. I didn't want that so I'd gambled and skipped the depot, and I would question her for the first time when I called her as a witness. I locked eyes for a moment with Sanger. She had sandy blonde hair and pale eyes. Her stare was as cold and angry as the eagles up on the wall. She was in full uniform, badge and commendation pins on display. This was the oldest trick in the book when it came to reminding a jury of the authority of a testifying law enforcement officer. But this wasn't a jury trial, and the uniform most likely would not impress the judge. Can she do that? Lucinda asked. Sit behind us like that? I looked from Sanger to my client. She was scared. Don't worry about her, I said. When court starts, she'll leave. She's a witness, and they're not allowed to be in court until they testify. That's why Harry Bosch isn't here. Before Lucinda could respond, the courtroom marshal stood at his desk, next to the door to the court side, holding cell, and announced the arrival of Judge Ellen Colho. The timing was perfect. As people in the courtroom stood, the door behind the bench opened and the black-robed judge took the three steps up to the black leather chair from which she would preside. Be seated, she said, her voice amplified by the coffered ceiling and the other acoustics of the courtroom. As I sat down, I leaned toward Lucinda and whispered, There will be some discussions with the judge, and then it will be your turn. 
like we talked about, be calm, be direct, look at me or the judge when you answer. Don't look at the other attorneys. Lucinda nodded hesitantly. She still looked scared, her light brown complexion turning pale. It's going to be okay, I said. You're ready for this. You'll be fine. But what if I don't? She said. Don't think like that. These people at the other table want to take the rest of your life away. They want to take your son away. Be angry at them, not scared. You need to get back to your son, Lucinda. They are trying to stop you from doing that. Think about that. I noticed motion behind her and looked up from our huddle to see Frank Silver pull out the chair on her other side and sit down. Sorry I'm late, he whispered. Hi, Lucinda, do you remember me? Before she could answer, I put my hand on Lucinda's arm to stop her and leaned across her to address Silver as quietly as my anger would allow. What are you doing here? I whispered. I'm co-counsel, he said. That was our deal. I'm here to help. What deal? Lucinda asked. There is no deal, I said. You need to leave, Frank, now. I'm not going anywhere, Silver said. Listen to me carefully, I said. You can't be here. It will throw. I was cut off by the judge. In the matter of Sands versus the state of California, we have a habeas corpus petition. Is counsel ready to proceed? Hayden Morris and I stood at the same time in our separate tables and affirmed that we were ready to proceed. Mr. Haller, the judge said, I have no record of you having a co-counsel. Who is seated next to your client? Silver stood up to me answer the question himself, but I beat him to it. Mr. Silver is the plaintiff's original defense attorney in this case, I said. He just came by to show his support for her. He is not co-counsel. Cole looked down at the paperwork in front of her on the bench. He is on your witness list, is he not? She asked. I recall that name, I believe. Yes, Your Honor, I said. He is, and he just wanted to be here at the start, as I said, to show his support. He will step out now. In fact, Your Honor, Plaintiff requests that all witnesses be excused from the courtroom until they are called upon to testify. Morris, who had already sat down, shot back up to his feet and told the judge that the witness I was referring to was Surgeon Stephanie Sanger, who was in the courtroom for a state motion to quash her subpoena for improper service. All right, we'll get into that, Colo said. But first, Mr. Silvert, you are excused from the courtroom. I was still standing, readying for the argument about Sanger, and I'd already dismissed Silver from my thoughts. I had to keep my eyes on the prize and not be distracted. Morris obviously wanted to keep Sanger off the stand and as far away from the case and my questioning as possible. I could not allow that. In my peripheral vision, I saw Silver slowly stand and push back his chair. I turned and gave a quick nod, so it looked like we were close colleagues, and of one mind on this miscarriage of justice. He played along, giving Lucinda a pat on the shoulder before moving by me to the gate. He smiled and nodded in a supportive way while he whispered, Fuck you, and I'm not testifying. Good luck hitting me with a subpoena. I nodded as though he had just whispered words of great inspiration. And then he was gone. I remained standing for the argument to come while opening a file on the table with a copy of the subpoena Bosch had dropped on Sanger. I had no idea how Morris was going to challenge this. Judge Colva waited until Silver was almost to the courtroom door before continuing. Mr. Morris, you may proceed, she said. For the next five minutes, Morris argued that the subpoena served on Surgeon Sanger should be quashed because opposing counsel, me, was on a fishing expedition with no evidentiary basis for putting Sanger on the stand. Surgeon Sanger is involved in ongoing investigations that could be compromised if counsel strays willy-nilly in his questioning. He is trying to grandstand with this witness, Your Honor, and it could come at the expense of justice in other cases. Additionally, counsel's application for the subpoena is based on an identification made by the plaintiff that was highly suspect and did not conform to standard procedures for photographic identification. That alone makes the subpoena invalid. Tell me about the photo identification, Colo said. Yes, Your Honor. Plaintiff's investigator showed her a series of photos in the visiting room at the prison where she was housed. This allowed him to steer her identification to Surgeon Sanger. This then became the basis for the subpoena you signed. As the court knows, a proper photographic display to a witness would be what is commonly known as a six-pack, where the individual is shown six photos at once and without any outside influence as to which photo, if any, to choose. But now it is too late. The identification is tainted, and the people ask that the subpoena be quashed. Morris sat down. I was relieved. 
The assistant AG's argument was complete bullshit. Morris was clearly grasping at straws, which told me how concerned he was about Sandra testifying. I now just had to make sure I could get her on the stand. Mr. Haller, the judge said, your response. Thank you, judge, I said. I would love to respond. First of all, I've practiced law in this town for decades, and this is the first time I've ever heard the term willy-nilly put forth as the basis of an objection. I must have missed that in law school, but to use my colleague's word, his argument is willy-nilly and, I'll add, absurd. My investigator Harry Bosch stood more than 40 years as a police officer and detective with the Los Angeles Police Department. He knows how to conduct a proper photo lineup. He first asked the supervisors at the prison for a private attorney room to meet with Miss Sands, but he was denied that. So he met with Miss Sands in a booth, in the visitation room, and proceeded as outlined in my request for a subpoena. He showed Miss Sands one photo at a time and did not pick the phone up until after she had seen all six photos. That was when she made the identification. There was nothing untoward, nothing sneaky, nothing, even willy-nilly, whatever that means, and, Your Honor, a prison camera recorded every moment of it. If there were any truth to the accusation of a tainted identification, then Mr. Morris would have shown us the video from that camera. If we want to delay this hearing and further the illegal incarceration of Lucinda Sands, we can halt everything while the court orders that the video be brought forward for review. Your Honor, Morris said. Not yet, Mr. Morris Colo said. Mr. Haller, a response to the first part of the objection. Mr. Morris makes reference to other investigations of a confidential nature, I said. He's clearly desperate. I have no intention of bringing up any investigation other than the flawed and corrupt investigation into the killing of Roberto Sands. The witness he is trying to keep from testifying was knee-deep in that investigation and Mr. Morris wants to prevent the court from finding out the truth about this matter. No other investigation will be mentioned. I stipulate to that right now. If I stray from it, the court can shut me down. There was a pause and then Morris tried for his second bite of the apple. Your Honor, if I could respond briefly, he said. That won't be necessary, Colo said. Do you have a video recording of the investigator showing the plaintiff the photos? No, Your Honor, I don't, Morris said. Have you seen it? Colo pressed. Was it the basis of your motion? No, Your Honor, Morris said meekly. Our basis was the subpoena request from the plaintiff. Then you are unprepared to support your argument. Colo said. The motion to quash is denied. Sergeant Sanger is excused from the courtroom until such time as she is called to testify. Anything else, gentlemen, before we start hearing from witnesses in this matter? Morris stood up at his table again. Yes, Your Honor, he said. Very well, Colo said. What have you got? As the court knows, this motion was sealed by the court at the request of the state, Morris said. This was to prevent it from being played out in the media as opposing counsel has shown a propensity to do in past cases. I stood up. Objection, I said. Your Honor, the Assistant Attorney General is doing anything and everything in his power to distract the court from the fact, Mr. Haller, Kuo said forcefully, I don't like counsel interrupting each other. If I deem that Mr. Morris' argument has merit, you will get your chance to respond. Now, sit down, please, and let him finish. I did as I was told, hoping my objection would at least throw Morris off his game. Thank you, Your Honor, Morris said, as I was saying, this motion was sealed by the court until such time as a hearing on the matter began. Which is right now, Mr. Morris Colo said. I know where you are going with this. I see representatives of the media in the gallery and have approved a request for a courtroom artist. This matter is no longer sealed. We are in open court. What is your objection? The court received the request for a courtroom artist on Friday, Morris said. We were all copied. At that time, this matter was still under seal and that the media was somehow alerted to it. The state asked for sanctions against plaintiff's counsel for violating the court order sealing the petition. I stood once again, but did not interrupt. I just wanted the judge to know I was ready to respond. But she held out a hand and patted the air a signal for me to sit down again. I did. Mr. Morris, you are doing what two minutes ago you accused Mr. Haller of, Colo said, playing to the media. I am sure that if I asked Mr. Haller whether he alerted the media to this hearing before the seal was lifted, he would say he did not and that there is no evidence to the contrary. Frankly, I think he is too smart to have done such a thing himself. So, Mr. Morris, 
Unless you can provide such evidence, then all you are doing here is grandstanding. I would rather you did not. I would rather get to what we are actually here to do. There will be no sanctions. Now, Mr. Haller, are you ready to proceed? I stood up, this time buttoning my jacket, as though it were a shield and I was going into battle. We are ready, I said. Very well, the judge said. Call your first witness. I had turned down an offer from Judge Colho to allow Lucinda Sands to dress in street clothes supplied by her mother. I didn't want to agree to anything that would distract from the fact that this woman had been in prison for five years for a crime she did not commit. I wanted her appearance to be a constant reminder to the judge of how a wrongful prosecution had taken everything away from her. Her son, her family, her freedom, and her livelihood, and left her with a blue jumpsuit with CDC, NMNT stencil on it, front and back. Sitting in the witness chair, Lucinda seemed small, her face barely rising above the ornate wooden railing in front of her. Her hair was pulled back in a short ponytail. The line of her jaw was sharp. She looked scared but resolute. I would question her first. That would be the easy part. Morris' cross-examination was where the danger lay. He had the transcripts from the first interview she'd given investigators almost six years ago and the deposition taken at China two months ago. While I had avoided using the deposition option that came with a civil action, Morris had elected to depose Lucinda, a clear sign of his strategy. If he could catch her in a single lie, he could discredit her and the whole claim that she was innocent. Is it all right if I call you Cindy? I asked. Oh, yes, she said. Cindy, please tell the court where you live and how long you have lived there. Before Lucinda could speak, Morris cut in. Your Honor, the aspects of Miss Sands' incarceration for a crime she confessed to are well known to all parties in the court, he said. Can we just move to matters German to the petition? Is that an objection, Mr. Morris? Colo asked. Yes, Your Honor, it is. Very well. Sustained. Mr. Haller, move on and get to the reason we are here today. I nodded. So it was going to be like that. Yes, Your Honor, I said. Cindy, did you kill your ex-husband, Roberto Sands? I did not, Lucinda said. But he pleaded no contest to manslaughter in the case. Why would you plead to something you now say you didn't do? I'm not saying it just now. I have said it all along. I told the sheriffs. I told my family. I told my lawyer. I did not shoot Roberto. But Mr. Silver told me the evidence was too much that a jury would find me guilty if we had a trial. I have a son. I wanted to see my son again. I wanted to hug him and be part of his life. I didn't think I would get so many years. It was said in such a heartfelt manner that I paused and looked at the legal pad in front of me on the lectern so I could let Lucinda's words hang in the courtroom like a ghost. But the judge, who had been appointed for life more than a quarter of a century ago, had witnessed every trick in the book and wasn't having it. No further questions, Mr. Haller, she said. No, Your Honor, I have more, I said. Cindy, why don't you tell the court what happened that night nearly six years ago? This was the dangerous part. Lucinda could not stray from what was already repeatedly on the record. We could add to it, which I intended to do. But we could not deviate from what was there. To do so would get Morris all he needed to send her back to China to finish her sentence. Roberto had our son for the weekend, Lucinda began. He was supposed to bring him home at six so we could go to my mother's house for dinner. But he didn't bring him till almost eight o'clock, and he'd had dinner. Already a Chuck E. Cheese. Did that upset you? I asked. Yes, I was very upset, and we had an argument. Me and Robbie. And he. Before we get to that, did Roberto tell you why he was late? He just said he had a work meeting, and I knew that was a lie because it was Sunday and his unit didn't work on Sundays. Okay, so you didn't believe him, and you argued. Is that what happened? Yes, and then he left. I slammed the door because he had ruined my plans for that night. And what happened next? I heard the gunshots. Two. How did you know they were gunshots? Because I grew up hearing guns in Boyle Heights and Roberto, when we were married, took me to a gun range to teach me how to shoot. I know what a gunshot sounds like. So you hear two gunshots, and what do you do? I thought it was him, Roberto, shooting at the house because he was mad, you know. I ran back to my son's room and we got on the floor. But that was it, no more shots. Did you make a 911 call? I called, yes. I told them my ex-husband is out there shooting in my house. What did they tell you to do? 
to stay with my son and hide until they checked it out. Did they tell you to stay on the line? Yes. Then what happened? I don't know how much time went by, but then they said it was safe outside and that I should go to the door because a deputy was there. Did you do that? Yes, and that's when I saw him. Roberto was lying on the ground and they said he was dead. I paused and asked the judge to allow me to play the recording of the 911 call Lucinda had just described. Morris did not object the recording was played on the courtroom's AV equipment. It did not deviate from the description Lucinda had just given, but her voice on tape had an urgency and fear in it that was absent in her recounting of the event all these years later. I felt that it was good for the judge to hear it and was surprised that Morris had not tried some sort of objection to block. After the call was played, I pivoted to a new line of questioning. Now, Cindy, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that when you and Roberto were married, he took you to a range to learn how to shoot. Can you tell the court more about that? Like what? Like how many times you went to the range? It was two or three times. It was before our son was born. Once he was born, I didn't want to have guns or shoot. But at that time, before your son was born, did you own a gun? No, they were Robbie's guns. All of them. How many guns did he have? I'm not sure. Like five. And he had bought all of these. No, he told me he took some of them away from people. Bad people. If they found them with guns, they would take them away. Sometimes they kept them. Who is they, Cindy? His unit? It was. Morris objected, but not fast enough. Mention of the unit was out there. Morris argued that the answer should be stricken from the record and that the story and whatever else Lucinda was about to say would be her say, based on the alleged statement of a man who is now dead. The judge sustained the objection without giving me a chance to argue it. But that was okay because everyone in the courtroom, including, and most important, the judge, knew who they were, the other members of Roberto Sanz's anti-gang unit. Okay, I said. Cindy, tell us about the training at the range you did with your then-husband. Well, Lucinda began, he taught me about the different parts of the gun and how to stand and point when firing. We shot at targets. Do you remember what stance you were taught to take? Yes. And what was it called? Oh, I thought you meant if I remembered the stance. I don't remember if it was called anything. Aren't you saying you could demonstrate it if the court allowed it? Uh, yes. I asked the court's permission to have Lucinda step down from the witness stand and demonstrate the shooting stance her husband had taught her. Morris objected, arguing that such an exercise would waste the court's time because the demonstration could not be connected in any way to the shooting of Roberto Sands. Your Honor, I countered, I plan to prove that Lucinda Sands did not fire the shots that killed her ex-husband. This demonstration is one of the dots that will be connected along the way. I'll allow it, Colo said, but I will hold you to your promise to connect those dots. Proceed. Thank you, Judge. Cindy, would you show us what you were taught by your husband? Lucinda stepped down into the well, the open space in front of the judge's bench. She spread her feet at least two feet apart for stability and brought her arms up straight and extended at shoulder height. She used her left hand to steady her right, the index finger pointing like the barrel of a gun. Like this, she said. Okay, thank you, I said. You can return to the witness stand. As Lucinda returned, I went to the plaintiff's table to get a file. I opened it and asked permission to show two photographs to the witness. I gave copies to Morris, even though he had already received these in discovery, and they had been part of the so-called evidence against Lucinda five years before. I also gave copies to the judge. They showed Lucinda at the range, holding a gun in the same stance she had just demonstrated in the courtroom. Mr. Haller, I'm concerned, the judge said after reviewing the photos. You're asking to place into exhibit two photos that would tend to show that your client had access to a firearm and knew how to use it. Are you sure this is wise? It's one of the dots, Your Honor, I said, and the court will soon understand that the photos are exculpatory, not damning to my client's cause. Very well, Colo said. It's your show. I walked a third set of photos to the witness stand and put them down in front of Lucinda. Lucinda, can you identify when and where those two photos were taken? I asked. I don't know the exact date, Lucinda said. But it was when Robbie taught me how to shoot. This was the range we would go to in Sand Canyon. Sand Canyon. Is that in the Antelope Valley? I think it's Santa Clara Valley. But nearby? Yes, not too far. 
Okay, in that second photo, who is that man next to you? That's Robbie. Your husband at the time? Yes. Who took that photo? It was one of his friends from the unit. He was teaching his wife how to shoot there too. Do you remember his name? Keith Mitchell. Okay, and in the pictures, the gun you are holding, where is that now? I don't know. When you and your husband divorced, did he leave you any of the guns he possessed? No, none. I didn't want them in my house. Not with my son there. I nodded as if her answer were important and looked at my legal pad, where I had outlined my examination. I used a pen to check off the different avenues of questioning I had covered. Okay, I said, let's go back to the night of your ex-husband's death. What happened after you opened the door for the deputy and saw Roberto's body on the lawn? Was he face down or face up? Face down, Lucinda replied, and what happened next with you? They took me and my son and made us sit in the back of a patrol car. And how long were you there? Um, it seemed like a long time, but then they took me and put me in a different car from my son. An unmarked car. You were eventually driven to the Antelope Valley substation and questioned? Yes. Before that, were you asked to allow your hands and clothes to be tested for gunshot residue? Yes, I was asked to step out of the car, and they tested me. You were swabbed with a foam disc? Yes. And who conducted this test? A deputy. A woman. Now, there came a time when my investigator Harry Bosch visited with you at the prison in China and asked if you would look at some photographs. Yes. You wanted to see if you could identify the female deputy you swabbed, you correct? Yes. He showed you six different photographs? Yes. And did you pick one of those photographs and identify the person who swabbed you? Yes. I gave copies of the photo of Stephanie Sanger from Bosch's photo lineup to Morris and the judge. Permission was quickly granted to enter the photo as plaintiff's exhibit, too, and show it to the witness. Is that the woman you identified as the deputy who tested you for gunshot residue? Yes, that's her, Lucinda said. Did you know her? No. You didn't know she was in your husband's unit with the sheriff's department? No, I didn't know her, but she told me she worked with Robbie. Did she seem upset that Robbie was dead? She was calm. Professional? I nodded. I had gotten everything I needed on the record. Most of it would pay dividends at later points in the hearing. I was pleased. I now had to hope that Lucinda would stand up to a cross-examination from Morris. If she survived that, I knew we had a solid chance. I have no further questions, I said, but I reserve the right to call the witness back to the stand. Very well, Mr. Haller, the judge said. Mr. Morris, would you like to take a break before you begin your cross-examination? Morris stood. The state would welcome a short break, Your Honor, he said, but I have only two questions for this witness, and they require only yes or no answers. Perhaps the break could come after the witness is excused. Very well, Mr. Morris, the judge said. Proceed. To say I was surprised would be an understatement. Morris was either a lot smarter than I'd given him credit for or a lot dumber. It was hard to tell because I had never seen him in court before this day. The AG usually hired the best and brightest, and for most of them, the beast hearings were a walk in the park. But based on his previous motions and his habit of contesting, what he called my lack of good faith discovery, he hadn't seemed to be mailing in. So his letting the petitioner off the stand with just two questions gave me pause. Maybe he sensed that he could not shake Lucinda's story because she was telling the truth. I watched attentively as Morris went to the lectern to ask his two questions. Miss Sands, you reside at the state prison for women in China, correct? Morris asked. Oh, yes, Lucinda said, correct. Do you know another inmate there named Isabella Motor? Lucinda looked over at me, a momentary flash of what do I do, panic entering her eyes. I hope the judge didn't see it. I simply nodded. There was nothing else I could do. Lucinda looked back at Morris. Yes, she said. She was in my cell. Then she got transferred to another prison. With that answer, I knew exactly what the state's strategy was and how Morris planned to play it. I tailed to Lucinda and then came out of the courtroom like an escaped prisoner. Moving fast, looking up and down the hall, I saw Stephanie Sanger sitting on a bench against the wall opposite the courtroom entrance. She smirked when she saw me as if she knew what Morris had just done. I didn't have time to throw a smirk back at her. I kept scanning the hall until I saw Bosch standing by the elevator. He looked like he was chatting with the marshal who ran the metal detector. 
The courtrooms on this floor were used primarily for criminal cases, thus the security scan in addition to the metal detector on the first floor of the building. Bosch glanced over, saw me, and held up an I'll be right back finger to the marshal. I stopped and waited for him to join me halfway down the hall, so we would be out of earshot of both Sanger and the deputy Bosch had been conversing with. How'd she do? Bosch whispered. Fine on the direct, I said. But it took only two questions from the assistant AG to undo everything. What? What happened? He's going to sandbag us with a prison informant. I need you to find out everything you can by tomorrow morning about an inmate named Isabella Motor. I think it's M.O.D. Rudy. What about handling the witnesses? I'll have to do it. I need you on Motor. Now. Okay. Is she a Chino? Who is she? She was Lucinda's old cellmate. But they moved her about six months ago, about the time I filed the Habeas. And her name didn't come up in Discovery? Isn't that a vi? Morris didn't need to put her in if she was going to be used for rebuttal. So no violation. A good clean sandbagging. I should have seen it coming. So what's the hurry if Morris isn't going to call her until after her case? Because the best defense is a good offense. I need to know if we're going to be able to neutralize her whenever they put her on the stand. Got it. Did Cindy tell you what she told Motor? She didn't tell her anything. Motor's a jailhouse snitch. She's going to lie. She's going to say Lucinda admitted to killing her husband. That's bullshit. It doesn't matter. That's why I want you to get out of here and find out everything you can about her. Find me something I can burn her to the ground with. I'm on it. Call Cisco if you need help. No stone left unturned, but you're working against the clock. I should be finished with my witnesses tomorrow. That's when Morris will bring Motor in. If I'm on this, I will be able to get Dr. Arslan into court tomorrow morning. I'll deal with her. You go. Call me as soon as you have something. Court is dark this afternoon, because Colo has a judge's conference. I'm going to put Sanger on the stand now, Arslanian, and the rest tomorrow. That includes you, so get going on motor. I'll call you. Good luck with Sanger. Luck won't have anything to do with it. Bosch walked off toward the elevator. I checked my watch. There were still a few minutes left in the break. I went into the restroom, cupped my hands under the cold water at a sink, then held my hands to my face. There was a heaviness growing in the center of my chest. It was the feeling of being unprepared. I hated the feeling more than anything in the world. On my way back to the courtroom I saw Sanger still posted on the bench. Not going so good, is it? she said. I stopped and looked at her. She had that smirk again. It's going great, I said. And you're next. With that, I opened the courtroom door and went in. The marshals were returning Lucinda from the courtroom lockup to the plaintiff's table, a sign that the judge was ready. I took my seat next to my client as the shackles came off her wrists and ankles, and one wrist was locked to the steel ring on the underside of the table. What will happen now? She whispered. I'm going to call Sanger, put her on the record, then tomorrow we prove she's a liar. No, I mean what happens now with Isabella? Harry is working on it, trying to find something we can impeach her with. Impeach? Prove she's lying. You sure you never talked about your case with her? Never. We never talked about her case either. All right. I need you to think, Lucinda. Is there anything you know about her that will help us? I can almost guarantee she's going to come in here and testify that you told her you'd kill Roberto. I need to come back at her with something. Is there? The marshal interrupted us with his call to rise. We stood in the judge, entered the courtroom, and bounded up the steps to the bench. Ellen Colho had been on the federal bench for nearly 30 years. She was a Clinton appointee, which tended to put her on the liberal side, which was good for us. But when push came to shove, I had no idea what her view of jailhouse stitches would be. Continuing in the matter of Sands versus the state of California, she said, Mr. Howler, call your next witness. I called Stephanie Sanger. Since Bosch was no longer in the hall to wrangle witnesses, I asked the judge to send one of the courtroom marshals to get her. The judge seemed annoyed but complied, and while we waited I turned back to my client. I need something to go at Isabella with, I whispered. Try to remember what you talked about. When they put the lights out at night, did you two talk? Yes, it's hard to fall asleep. I can imagine. Did she ever? The rear door of the courtroom opened and the marshal entered, followed by Sanger, who walked down the center aisle and through the gate. She stopped by the witness chair and took the oath from the clerk before sitting. 
I moved to the lectern with my files and notes. Your Honor, I said, before I begin, I ask the court to declare Deputy Sanger a hostile witness. She's your witness, Counselor, Colvo said. On what grounds should I declare her to be hostile to the petitioner? I wanted Sanger declared hostile as it gave me more freedom. During direct examination, I could pose leading questions to which only a yes or no is required. This would allow me to stop those questions with facts I wanted the judge to hear, even if Sanger denied them. The information would still get through. As you saw this morning, she has already attempted to avoid testifying. Your Honor, I said, add to that a short conversation I just had with her during the break. She clearly doesn't like me, my client, or being here. Morris stood to respond, but Colvo held her hand up like a stop sign. Let's just see how it goes, Mr. Haller, she said. Proceed with your examination. Morris sat down and Sanger seemed pleased with my failure to persuade the judge. Thank you, Judge, I said. Deputy Sanger, you are employed by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, correct? I am, Sanger said. And it's Sergeant. When did you get that promotion? Two years ago. What is your current assignment with the department? I'm assigned to the Antelope Valley substation, where I'm in charge of the gang intervention unit. You have been with that unit for several years, yes? Yes. And now you are in charge of it. I just said that. Yes, thank you. You were assigned to that unit at the time of Deputy Roberto Sanz's death, correct? I was. Were the two of you partners? No, we don't have partners per se on the unit. There are six deputies and a surgeon. We work as a team and on any given day, depending on vacations and sick outs, you could be partnered with any of the five other deputies. It changes all the time. Thank you, the deputy, for that, Clarif, Sergeant. I'm sorry, Sergeant. Thank you for the clarification. So based on that, sort of round robin of interactions and partnerships, is it correct to say you knew Deputy Sands well? Yes, we worked together for three years before he was murdered by his ex-wife. I looked up at the judge. Your Honor, I said, I'd say that's pretty hostile. The witness is revealing a belief that is counter to my client's cause. Just proceed, Mr. Haller, Colo said. I looked in my notes and quickly regrouped. I had to move carefully now and walk Sanger into a truth trap. If I had her under oath and on the record, saying something I could later prove false, it would go a long way toward making the case that Lucinda was corruptly or at least wrongfully convicted. Let's talk about the murder of Deputy Sands, I said. It happened on a Sunday. Do you recall how you found out that he had been killed? I had a SOS text, Sanger said, like everybody in the department. Can you tell the judge what a SOS text is? The Special Operations Reporting System is a texting service that allows the department to get messages to all sworn personnel. A text went out that said there had been a deputy involved shooting in the AV division and that we had lost one of our own. AV as in Antelope Valley? Correct. I then made a call and found out that the deputy killed was Roberto Sanz from my unit. And what did you do? I called another deputy in the unit and we proceeded to the scene to see if we could be of any help. Which deputy was that? Keith Mitchell. Why did you only call him when you say the unit consisted of six deputies and a surgeon? Because Keith was the closest to Robbie Sands. I opened the file I had brought to the lectern and took out three copies of a document. I distributed them to Morris, the witness, and the judge and asked Colho for permission to enter the document as the next plaintiff's exhibit and to question the witness about it. Permission was granted. What is that, surgeon? It's a copy of the SORS text that went out, Sanger said. And what time does it say it went out? 2018 hours. Or 818 minutes on military time, correct? Correct. How soon after that went out did you arrive at the crime scene? Probably no more than 15 minutes later. The AV, as you call it, is a big place. How was it that you were so close? You could be there within 15 minutes. I happened to be eating dinner at a restaurant nearby. What restaurant was that? Brandy's Cafe. Were you with anyone? I was alone at the counter. I got the text, put down some money, and immediately left. I called Keith Mitchell on my way. She said it in a tired tone, as if I were asking irrelevant questions with no bearing on the case. The judge must have felt like this as well. She interrupted me. Mr. Haller, she said, is this line of questioning really necessary? It is, judge, I said. 
That will become clear when other witnesses testify. Well, please hurry through this so we can get to those witnesses sooner rather than later. We would get there sooner if my examination were not interrupted. If that remark is intended as a rebuke to the court, we have a problem, sir. I'm sorry, Your Honor, it was not intended as a rebuke in any way. May I continue? Please, but hurry. I nodded and checked my notes to make sure I picked up where I had left off. Sergeant Sanger, were homicide investigators on the scene when you arrived? I asked. No, not yet, Sanger said. Who from the sheriff's department was there? A lot of deputies had arrived to secure the scene for the homicide unit, rolling from the STRS center in Whittier. That would put them as much as an hour out, correct? Yes, most likely. So during that time of waiting for the homicide team, you decided to do their job for them, didn't you? No, that's not correct. Well, didn't you take Lucinda Sands from the car she had been placed in and conducted tests for gunshot residue on her body and clothes? Yes, I did that. It's best to conduct such a test as soon as possible after a shooting crime has been committed. Was it procedure for a deputy who worked with the victim to swamp the arms and hands of a suspect for a gunshot residue test? She was not a suspect at that time. It is not a suspect. Why was she put in the back of a patrol car and swabbed for GSR as she was not a suspect? Morris stood up and objected. Your Honor, he said, counsel is badgering the witness and not allowing her to finish her answers. Mr. Haller, Colo said, let her complete her answers and dial back the tone. There is no jury here to impress. I nodded contritely. Yes, Your Honor, I said, Sergeant Sanger, by all means, please, continue and finish your answer. As I said, it is important to test for gunshot residue early in an investigation, Sanger said. Otherwise, the evidence can dissipate or be removed or transferred. I knew in this case that it might be an hour or more before homicide investigators were on scene, so I swabbed the defendant and secured the swamp discs in an evidence bag. She's the petitioner, not the defendant, Sergeant. Once you completed, this test you say was required so urgently, what did you do with that evidence bag containing the swab discs? I turned it over to Deputy Mitchell, who later gave it to the homicide team. It should be noted in the evidence chain of custody report, which I'm sure you've seen. What if I told you it is not in the chain of custody report? Then that would be a slight oversight on Deputy Mitchell's part. Nice of you to throw Deputy Mitchell under the bus, but why didn't you just turn it over to the homicide team yourself? You conducted the test. Were you trying to hide that, Sergeant? I wasn't hiding anything. I was going to leave the crime scene. I went to tell Deputy Sands's girlfriend at the time what had happened. I thought she should hear it from one of Robbie's friends before she saw it on the news. That was very noble of you, Sergeant Sanger. Thank you. She said it with a solid tone of sarcasm. I was near the end of my questioning. I decided it was time to rock her boat with a big time wave. Sergeant Sanger. Were you aware that at the time of his murder, Roberto Sands was in a sheriff's gang? Sanger actually did rock back in her seat a few inches. Morris quickly stood and objected. Assumes facts, not in evidence, he said. Your Honor, counsel is on a fishing expedition, hoping the witness will misspeak and give him something he can blow out of proportion. I shook my head. I walked to the petitioner's table and opened a file containing several copies of the photos from the Roberto Sands autopsy. I made sure Lucinda did not see them. Your Honor, this is no fishing expedition, and I think counsel knows it. I said, I am prepared, if the court will indulge me, to show this witness. Proof that her colleague was a member of a sheriff's clique. If the court needs it, I can also bring in an expert on the internal investigation by the sheriff's department and the external investigation by the FBI into these clusters of gangsters with badges probes that resulted in a former sheriff going to prison and wholesale changes in personnel and training within the department. It was a bluff. The expert was the FBI agent Massasic, and so far I hadn't been able to get to him. If pressed by the court, I would bring in the Los Angeles Times reporter who exposed the scandal and covered its multiple investigations. Luckily, I needed neither. I don't think we need an expert to tell us about the well-known problems in the sheriff's department at the time of this murder. Colvo said, The witness will answer the question. All eyes in the courtroom returned to Sanger. I asked if she needed me to repeat the question. No, she said. I was not aware of Roberto being in a clique or a gang or whatever you want to call it. 
If the court allows, I am going to show you two photos, I said. They were taken during the autopsy of Roberto Sanz. I approached the bench and handed the judge a set of photos showing Sanz's body on the autopsy table and the close-up of the tattoo on the body's hip. I turned and gave Morris a set. He immediately stood and objected to the inflammatory nature of the photos. This man was a hero, your honor, he said. Counsel wants to flaunt these photos that purport to show gang affiliation when they show and prove nothing. Your honor, I countered, the petitioner can bring in an expert on this subject who will identify the tattoo on Roberto Sanz's body, incidentally located in a place that would not be seen by the public, if necessary. But just a casual Google search by the court or anyone else would confirm that Sanz's secret tattoo directly connects him with a so-called clique that operated in the Antelope Valley. The judge did not take long to render a decision. You may show the witness, she said. I approached the witness stand and handed Sanger a set of photos. Do you recognize that tattoo, Surgeon Sanger? I asked. I do not, Sanger said. You did not know of your unit member's association with the Kukos, a known sheriff's clique. I did not and I don't think a tattoo is proof of that. Do you have such a tattoo, Surgeon? I do not. I paused there and in my peripheral vision saw Morris stand, anticipating that my next move would be to ask the court to have Sanger's body inspected for tattoos. But I didn't. I wanted that possibility to hang over the judge's eventual decision on the petition. I have one more question for now, I said. Sergeant, what was your phone number that was linked to the special operations reporting system? Morris, who was in the act of sitting down, suddenly bolted to his feet. He spread his arms wide and displayed an exaggerated look of shock and horror on his face. Objection, Your Honor, he said. What could the plaintiff possibly want with the revelation of this law enforcement officer's private number, other than to expose it to the media and the public? Can you answer that, Mr. Haller? The judge asked. Your Honor, I am not trying to expose her private number to the public. I said. But she testified to having received notice of the Sands killing on her cell phone and the petitioner is entitled to that phone number as part of the evidence in this case. If the court would order the witness to privately disclose the number to me through Mr. Morris or the clerk of the court, that would be fine. But why would he need the number other than to harass the witness with phone calls? Morris said. Judge, I will never distribute or call the number, I said, and you can hold me in contempt if I do. Then why do you need the number, Mr. Haller? The judge asked. I spread my arms in surprise in the same way Morris had just moments earlier. Your Honor, please, I said. Are you asking me to stand here and outline my case strategy for Mr. Morris? Let's just calm things down here, the judge said. She seemed to understand her misstep. She considered her ruling for a long moment before responding. 